right, we have a full house. Thank you, everyone, for your patience tonight. Um, we were in closed session working on something that we'll talk about a little bit later tonight. Um, I'm going to call to order the Monday, March 16, 2020 meeting to order. We're going to begin with an invocation given by Commissioner Macy, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. I ask that you stand if you can. I've been seeing the following tweet everywhere. I imagine all the closures and cancellations give people a sense of ominousness, but it's really an amazing act of social solidarity. We're sacrificing so we can give nurses, doctors, and hospitals a fighting chance. Start from there and hopefully we can figure out the rest. That's from Matt Pierce by LA Times. I couldn't agree more. I'm in awe of our community. Last week, in a matter of 24 hours, the world turned upside down. Our calendars empties and our homes filled up. There was panic buying, there was confusion, there was anger and derision and fear. But as the dust begins to settle on this strange new normal, we see a world in which we acknowledge not only how closely tied we are to each other, but also a world in which we show our deep level of care and concern for each other. In unison with communities across Michigan, states across the country, and countries around the world, we are called to make unprecedented changes to our lives for the good of our friends, our neighbors, and strangers alike. And it is happening. We didn't all come here to ask what we can do for our country, but we are showing we are willing to do it when asked. Tonight, our thoughts are turned towards patients and families, towards healthcare workers, towards first responders. But we lift up as well those everyday Americans who are making the sacrifices that give them a fighting chance. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This brings us to the public comment portion of our agenda. Uh, the City Commission values and relies on citizen input uh, to make decisions. Now is the time set aside for the public to address the City Commission on both agenda topics uh, as well as things that are not on the agenda. As there are no public hearings tonight, this will be the only time to address the City Commission. I ask that when you're up here that you address comments to the Commission as a whole and not to individual commissioners. If you wish to speak here tonight a public comment, uh, please wait until recognized by me, the mayor, come up to the podium, state your name and address for the record, and be, be mindful that the commission wishes to hear from anyone who wants to speak tonight, so comments are limited to three minutes or less, and we have a timer at the podium to help you keep track of your time. If you don't wish to speak tonight, perfectly understandable, uh, please never hesitate to reach out to us uh, by other means, such as email, etc. Um, please note that the City Commission doesn't respond directly to questions during com public comment. However, we do make note of those questions, and when the agenda topic is discussed, uh, we try to do our part to make sure those questions are asked. If your item isn't on the agenda, I know our City Manager, Mr. Gillum, here is taking copious notes, and he does uh, follow up accordingly uh, with those issues. So with that, who's first tonight? Yes, ma'am. My name is Ann Lip. I'm here on behalf of City Ramen, which is at 321 South Main Street, Royal Oak. Um, we, I was talking to uh, um, Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Spencer today about um, having our plan of operation amended so that we can offer beer and sake with carry-out uh, meals. It, if we can get that uh, plan of operation am amended and approved, it would really help them mitigate their losses in light of the fact that they can only serve carryout now. Our, um, our, the MLCC just approved our license last week, and now we can't use it because we can't, um, we can't have dine-in customers right now. So we, we're asking that you um, uh, approve that amendment. I, we also th ask that uh, you allow us to extend our hours to 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. so we can serve lunch as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lip. Anybody else wish here to speak tonight? Luigi. Uh, good evening to everyone. Luigi Cutraro, 12, 4, 15 South Washington. Um, um, I got in today. The, 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 today I, I got in in Royal Oak, you know, well, 30 minutes ago. And uh, you know, it really, it was so sad. I, I've been in the city, I don't even know how long, you know. I've been in the city for a long time. 
seeing the city today, it really, it looked like one of those, you guys ever watch one of those movies that you go and there is nobody there? I mean, it's, it's, um, it, it, it was just, um, it was just a terrible feeling. I don't know, I, this is, and I understand this is one of those deals you cannot blame anyone. You cannot blame the president, you cannot blame, this is something that happened. Um, but uh, the reason <laughs> um, I come in tonight is, uh, as you guys know, I've been a, a restaurant owner for many, many years in this great city. And, um, you know, uh, what I heard today from a governor which she had the rights to do that. I mean, I mean, if I would probably would have been in her shoes, I probably would have done the same thing. Um, but um, uh, uh, one thing is for sure: in the next two, three weeks, you know, a lot of, as you guys know, this city was built on on downtown. I mean, I feel like if it wouldn't be for downtown, they would, you know, there, there was there was a big steps for this uh, for Royal Oak. So I think I, um, in the next two, three weeks, especially small places like myself, um, uh, they, will have a, they, they will have a lot of problem. They will have a lot of, uh, because you know, I mean, uh, as you know, restaurant only work with, uh, despite what people thinking, you know, we, we work with about three to 6% profit. Okay, so, so we're not making a million dollars. So I wish, uh, um, uh, between the seat and, and the and the business, the downtown business, we can come up with something, which I don't know what, okay, but because in two weeks, I, I believe it will be more than two weeks, three weeks, you know, there will be a lot of people, a lot of restaurants, a lot of establishments that will not be able to open again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCarroll. Huh. Anybody else wish to speak tonight, Mr. Kroll? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Honorable Commissioners. Alan Kroll, 1050 Iroquois Boulevard. I'm here today to speak about the city manager um, choice that you'll be making later in the show, in the show, in the meeting. <laughs> be a little crazy to be at this show, probably, but I have a certain passion for it. My history in Royal Oak goes back a long way. Um, I was in the interviewing process a, a couple times ago when Mr. Hoover was selected. Um, there were some good local candidates and some out-of-town candidates, and it almost seemed like the out-of-town candidate all of a sudden became smarter than the local guys. Um, somehow we didn't know exactly who they were or what they could do, and we couldn't really check them out near as well as we could check out the local ones, and Mr. Hoover won. Um, Mr. Hoover was a very bright man. Uh, he could, he will, he did, but he didn't quite fit, and that's so critical to the decision you're gonna to make tonight is, is, is the fit. I have, uh, I sat through the initial round of interviews. Uh, I, I was here present. Um, I also was able to catch that again on TV. So I watched it twice in its entirety. I also um, watched the second round of interviews twice in their entirety. So I think I got a pretty good handle on all three candidates. And, and by the way, they're all great candidates. Um, I think Mr. Tungate stands out um, for a number of reasons. One of the interesting things about Mr. Tungate is we know where he lives. Um, he was easy to do research on. He spent eight years in Oak Park. If you want to talk about diversity, which came up often in the interviewing process, I mean, there, there's just about everybody, everything going on in Oak Park. It's a very diverse place. Uh, with Middle Eastern to the east and eight mile to the south and and the Orthodox uh, Jews up to the north um, That that's quite a, a juggling match. He, he has there in Oak Park the, the thought that he could get liquor by the glass uh, Approved I, I don't know if you know the history behind that, but but that's almost an impossibility. That's that's almost a magic act um, so much to the point that when they, when they annexed Oak Park or Royal Oak Township, which had a slice of Greenfield uh, between 10 mile and 10 and a half mile, when they annexed that back to Oak Park, um, Black Lotus, which was a very successful restaurant there, 
uh, they took their liquor license away. So they, they weren't even grandfathered, and that, that's the extreme position that the Oak Park had. And I have no clue how he was able to get that approved. But from an economic development point of view, it makes great sense. I, I, I look at all of you and I say, if I were up there, what, 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 what would I be thinking? Um, I spent quite a bit of time in the interviewing process. I spent the uh, first part of my career as a vice president for a Fortune 1000 company in many interviews, have had my own company for 28 years, and have interviewed, I can't even say. As I listened to all three of them, <coughs> it was almost like Dr. Mitchell and Mr. Brake were generalizing. And, and why not? How much information did they really have about us? Yet as I listened to Mr. Tungate, I, I, I wasn't hearing generalizations. I was kind of hearing issues that I know we have here that we need to address. Um, certainly he has an advantage because he gets in his car and drives two minutes and he's here. So he's an insider. That, that ranks really high in my book. I, I go back to Larry Doyle, who's my neighbor. Um, but, but when Larry was our city manager, he was, he was part of us. People would call and bitch at him about the snow plow. He'd look out the window and goes, yeah, mine's not plowed either. Something about being an insider. Um, Mr. Crowley, I, I do need you to finish. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Answer, I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I've said all I hate the name. I, I hope you'll choose Eric. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Crowley. Thank you for, for making that. Thank you for your email as well, or your text. Anybody else wish to speak tonight? All right. We're going to close public comment and bring the meeting back to this side of the table. Uh, before we make a motion to approve the agenda, there's a couple things that um, we'd like to add to the agenda. One is, um, you know, the COVID-19 discussion on city operations. Um, also, uh, discussion um, direction slash uh, um, on the Paradiso case uh, from closed session. And then finally, um, I know we had some uh, correspondence today related to city ramen. Uh, but more even a discussion on downtown uh, restaurants and, you know, what can be done during the, um, during this, uh, these troubling times related to COVID-19. Does anyone wish to make a motion? Commissioner Lavasser? I'll move to approve the amendment with the additions as stated by the mayor. We have a motion by Commissioner Lavasser, a second by Commissioner Dubuck. Discussion on the agenda? All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion passes. Okay, this brings us to the consent agenda. Um, item number six, does anyone wish to pull anything off the consent agenda? Okay, the consent agenda now consists of City Commission special meeting executive search, initial interviews, minutes February 22nd, City Commission meeting minutes February 24th, claims February 28th, March 9th, March 10th and March 13th, approval of purchase order, declaration and disposable, disposal of surplus property, Department of Public Services and Recreational request to fill pending vacancy, proclamation designating April 24, 2020 as Arbor Day, contract modification, CAP 2041, professional engineering services, um, approval of license agreement, Shrine Catholic School Athletic Complex, award of contract CAP 2009-2020 major road improvements, Award of Parking or Professional Engineering Services, Mahaney Meininger Senior Community Center Parking Lot, Award of Professional Engineering Services Surveying 2021 Projects, Approval of Grant Easement Speedway LLC, Approval of Grant Easement Community Choice Credit Union, and Receive and File Non Action Items, which consists of the Employee Satisfaction Survey Results. Is there a motion? Motion by Commissioner Douglas, uh, uh, seconded by Commissioner Perouche. Discussion? All right, with not a call for the vote, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Consent agenda is approved. Uh, this brings us to item number seven, 2020 Class C Liquor License Review, Chief O'Donohue. Uh, Mayor, City Commission, we did uh, complete our annual review of all on-premise liquor establishments and found uh, two violations were issued in 2019 as part of an MLCC <coughs> decoy operation, not a city operation. In December of 2019, Pranos was issued a violation for serving a minor. And in 2019, Royal of Tap House was issued a non-sufficient fund violation by the MLCC. Uh, the police department <coughs> continues to work with all our uh, uh, bars and restaurants in town uh, to kind of uh, identify potential issues before they escalate out of control. We have had uh, 
several meetings with the owner of Mr. B's uh, to try to mitigate some of the issues that uh, seem to be a trending increase in calls for service. Um, um, Chef Johnny is very engaged and, and we continue to work with him to kind of alleviate some of those issues. Um, our, our work with those tools has resulted in uh, fewer calls for service. However, towards the end of the year, we had um, three incidents that were directly related to the security staff. It says in 2019, but actually the third was in the beginning of 2020. Um, this prompted, a, they were very close, uh, close to each other. So we had a meeting with the owner. Um, he expressed genuine concern on what was going on and the inclusion of his meeting. Uh, he agreed that his entire security team needed to be replaced. Um, he, there was a number of other uh, things we worked with him to try to um, implement some changes, which included adding an additional manager on the weekends. Um, and we'll continue to monitor that, that establishment to see if there's any further issues. All liquor license renewal fees have been paid to the clerk's office. The fire department and building department have conducted their annual reviews and inspections of all on-premise establishments in Royal Oak. Jason Craig of the building department, Andy Blevins of the fire department state, there's just one location with outstanding issues. That's Diamond Steakhouse and Pinkies located at 100 South Main. Um, and uh, they, they just need to get some permits and complete work on uh, some fire suppression and other building issues. It's nothing they say that would rise to the level they'd recommend non-renewal. Um, the treasurer's office uh, has prepared a uh, separate report. Uh, this week has been a little bit challenging for us, so uh, we don't have that report available, but I, we have spoke with the treasurer today. She is working with all the establishments that are in the rears and is confident that a plan will be worked out. Um, enclosed in this report is also a six-year statistical summary of all calls for service and a synopsis of those calls, and then there's a link to the Oakland County Food Service Inspection Report. Any questions for Chief O'Donohue? No questions for Chief O'Donohue. Chief, are you looking for any action from us tonight, or are we just... Uh, uh, no. Proaction action means um, everything's normal, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Mayor Commissioners, that's absolutely correct. Um, in order for the city to uh, offer a recommendation of non-renewal for any of the liquor license establishments in town, you would have to... Uh, direct staff to schedule a, a hearing at your next commission meeting on the 30th because we would have to provide notice to the uh, licensee prior to that time. Um, in the alternative, if there is no action taken to schedule a hearing at the meeting on the 30th, um, absent that action, then the state will automatically renew the licenses for the 1920, I'm sorry, the 2020-21 calendar year. I mean, I think we've looked at this, um, I mean, since I've been up here every year for eight or nine years, I can't remember. And um, I think, you know, in my opinion, nothing really rises to the level of having to make a negative recommendation against any of our uh, restaurateurs. Um, we've had, you know, issues in the past with unpaid water bills and things like that. But, you know, I trust the treasurer that, you know, they, these businesses typically come through, you know, they have an unexpected water bill, they figure it out, they move forward and it doesn't linger. Some of the other issues I know, um, our police department has had a really good relationship with um, um, most of our, almost all of our restaurants. And when there are things that pop up from time to time, like with any business, they're on it and they work very cooperatively uh, to remedy the situation and find solutions that work for everybody and exactly how policing should be done and exactly how managing a liquor serving establishment should be done. So that's my opinion. Any dissenters? Okay, I don't see anybody uh, raising their hand to make any motion, so thank you very much uh, for the work. Um, is that, oh yeah, Lieutenant Spencer did this as well, perfect. Please give him our uh, accolades. It's not easy to compile all this data and make sure it's accurate and right, so you know, our thanks to him. Okay. All right, that brings us to item number eight, which is the approval of the naming committee recommendation for the new downtown park. Hey, Ms. Davids. Hey, um, I'm here on behalf of Robin Winters. He's our chairperson, and he's going <coughs> under the weather, so um, I'm stepping in for him. Uh, the naming committee met in January and um, took their task of naming the new downtown park, 
downtown park very seriously. They um, put together a questionnaire. They received over 118 different, um, 118 people participated, and I think that amounted to about 78 names. And I think that's a, a, one of the attachments um, that you got. Um, they decided uh, on Centennial Commons. Um, the motion was put forth by John Wenlin, and I think he said it very well that it's a once, unless you're planning on living to be 200 years old, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity <laughs> to name a park um, Centennial. So uh, the, that was unanimous, uh, Centennial. The, the, um, there was a little bit of back and forth over whether to call it Centennial Park or Centennial Commons, and ultimately Centennial Commons won out. Um, just eked it out, just three, three um, two vote, um, but they felt that they wanted to call it Commons because they wanted the park to feel, um, to just have a different sort of um, vibe than our other parts, that it was special, that it was a gathering place, it was for everyone, and so that's where they came up with that. And um, if you have any questions. Do have any questions for Ms. Davids, Commissioner Gibbs? I think this is a great name for the park, <coughs> or the Commons. <laughs> Let's get this straight. Um, <laughs> is there, or maybe I just don't understand, but um, will it be called Royal Oak Centennial Commons, or is Royal Oak being left off? Um, that's a good point. Um, I all I know, I I think all of our parks are just. I don't think any of them have Royal Oak before them, do they? No. I think it's just Centennial Commons. Oh, and I did want to point out that the Barbara Hallman. Memorial Plaza will keep its name and is not part of this naming. But but I, I but I don't. If it is Royal Oak um, Centennial Commons, we have one more R O C C <laughs> in the city. It seems like everything is R O C C. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out about the the memorial. Um, but I I think because my personal feeling is because this is Centennial. Like I'm only going to see it once. I'm not going to be around in. 21, 21. <laughs> wow, that's another good number. Um, I, but maybe it should it be Royal Oak Centennial Commons, and I'm okay with ROCC, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, that's a really good point. We did talk to MKSK. You know, part of the reason we got this process in motion is that they really um, felt that branding of the park is really important, and they so they gave us some um, guidelines about, like, names that are really good for branding. Um, but I don't know, I don't know if, I mean, I doubt that the naming committee would have any problem with it being Royal Oak Centennial Commons, but that's a really long mm -hmm. name, I think, for a sign. I don't know. Yeah, I and for branding purposes, I think it's shorter is better. Yeah, I think, I think you see this in other cities where, you know, like Central Park in New York or Grant Park in Chicago, you know, they don't really use the name anyways. And I think the fact that Commons is added to this versus Park is really interesting. I think that makes us stand. I think everyone, when they hear Centennial Commons, they're going to think Royal Oak mm -hmm. synonymous with it. And it's actually kind of easier, catchier. Yeah. And, you know, you'll get that ebb and flow between the two brands of Royal Oak being pretty darn awesome and then Centennial Commons being a really awesome place. People have already, like, in the office, some people have started calling it C-squared. And I don't know. <laughs> you know, I think it, I think it will... Um, as long as they don't try to pronounce it. <laughs> <That would be bad. laughs> I think it'll be very easy to, to brand. And obviously, um, our centennial is November 8th next year, and hopefully the park is done by then, so we can do something really special. Very good. Commissioner Dubot? Yeah, I would just say to the extent that we're doing public events and things, you know, if there's, say, a radio promo or something saying, you know, this event is at Centennial Commons in Royal Oak, uh, I think Royal Oak's always going to be associated with the brand. I, I like it. I like it. It's succinct. Yeah. It almost transcends beyond, you know, like, and I don't say it should transcend beyond Royal Oak, but I think, you know, we are a destination for, you know, not just people to come and want to live. That's very strong, but also for people to come and want to recreate and hang out. And, you know, I think that Centennial Commons will just be, you know, a simple name drawing from all over. Yeah. Commissioner Pruch? 
I know when we were having task force meetings, we weren't concentrating on the name so much, but we were concentrating on the fact that it was really unique and it was very special. And we were cognizant of the fact that if it all <coughs> opens up on time, it'll be the year that we're going to be celebrating our centennial. So I, I think this is a great name. And I think also I heard somewhere, and it may have been from you, Judy, that the city of Detroit is also developing, and I think it might be the one on the riverfront, a yes. centennial park. Um, so yes, but that... I, I'm sorry, the name escapes me, but I know that it's, I want to say Ralph Wilson Centennial Park, and it, the Centennial is really up to the person, and I've been to some different things in, in, in Detroit where I've seen that park presented, and they call it Wilson Park. Oh, okay. Because it's really the person that donated the money that is the big deal there, Net, and it's the Centennial. I, I don't know if he would have been 100. I don't you don't, I'm sorry, I don't know that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I've heard it referred to as Wilson Park in okay. Detroit. Okay, well, he, he certainly was the one that donated a heck yeah. of a lot of money for that and for a lot of other things down there. So it would make sense that they would honor him with naming the park or give yeah. him the naming rights anyway. Yeah. So, but I'll, but but I think the name is is great. It, and, and adding Royal Oak to it, I, to me it, it just, it, to me it would be a little, too long, a little too much of a, of a mouthful. People are going to call it Centennial Commons or just plain Centennial <coughs> when they refer to it. Mm -hmm. And we all know it's a Royal Oak Park, and we all know that all the other 50-some parks are Royal Oak Parks, oh, okay. so yeah. whether or not they're part of the name. And we have a year to get people used to the Commons, too, because I think people might call it Centennial Park, but we have a whole year to get them used to calling it Centennial Commons. Yes. So by the time it opens, um, I think people will call it by the right name. Yeah, I think you're right. Sure, um, first, I want to take this opportunity to say happy birthday to my grandmother, who's almost a century. She's 98 today. <laughs> Yay. And secondly, I want to say there's an online movement for this park to be reconsidered Parky McParkface, which was one of the suggested names. Yes. And while I don't think we can do that, um, there was in the comments, and I'm so sorry to whoever wrote this that I didn't write down the name, someone suggested that we could name the parking structure Parky McParkspace. <laughs> so I think we should consider that and maybe take that back to the naming committee. Yeah. Because so do you all know the history of Parky, Mc, Parky McParkface? There was a boating, a boat in the UK, a three million dollar vessel, and they asked the public what to name it. And a uh, like a BBC presenter suggested Bodie McBoatface, and it won. <laughs> and then they were like, "No, we're not naming it." <laughs> so Bodie McBoatface, but they did name a submarine Bodie McBoatface. So maybe that's the alternative: is the parking deck is Parky McPark deck? Space. Parky McPark, McPark space. space. Oh my God. <laughs> See. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> to be considered. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody want to make a motion? Commissioner Douglas? I'll move approval of uh, Centennial Commons. We have a second by Commissioner Dubuck. Discussion? Yeah, no, Commissioner I was going to second. Oh. Any other discussion? Uh, Commissioner Levasseur? I just wonder if Commissioner Macy's going to tag on her other suggestion <laughs> to this motion. I, I wanted, I was going to ask Judy to take it back to the yeah. naming commission. All right, good enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, Are if you, you want me to, I shall do that. <laughs> Are you serious? I mean, I'm not unserious. <laughs> okay. People would come to park in parking park space. I tell you that right now. Yeah, okay. You got it. <laughs> People. I don't know, it's a very conservative <laughs> naming community. Mm -hmm. If you name it, they will come. Yeah, You're going to have to explain it to them in detail as to where that came from. Yes. It's not going to be obvious to them. <laughs> no. All right. <laughs> that would be amazing. All right, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 And those opposed? Motion passes. This brings us to item number nine, which is approval of special event permit, Metro Times Blowout 2020. Uh, Mayor City Commission. Metro Times, in cooperation with the Royal Oak Downtown Development Authority, has requested authorization to hold the Metro Times Blowout 2020. Uh, this event will actually take place at various venues, uh, retailers, and um, restaurants. Uh, and it, it culminates in a, a large concert in the P7 parking lot on Saturday night only. The proposed event is a curated music and arts collaboration at venues and retailers throughout downtown as part of the festival. Live music will be provided by local and regional bands throughout the day, uh, culminating with the national headliner on Saturday evening. The event will include various vendors in the P7 lot, such as pop-up restaurants, food trucks, uh, general uh, vendors. 
there will be alcohol and non-alcoholic beverages available. Uh, city staff has had discussions with the event organizers. They expect 10 to 12 restaurants or bars to play live music inside their establishments, six to seven retail stores to showcase their artwork. Um, and uh, in this process um, is kind of a chicken or egg thing. We like to have all the details locked down before we present a uh, special event. Uh, they can't lock the details down until they get approval to have the special event. So part of this authorization is you're authorizing the police department to basically approve all the individual liquor establishments if their plan violates their plan of operation, if that makes sense. So we just want to make sure that um, the band fits for the venue it's going in, that kind of thing. So um, we're comfortable we can all agree and, and work together on that. Um, uh, this event is uh, scheduled to take place on Friday, uh, starting at 5 p.m., 2 a.m., and that will just be at the venues and retailers. And then on Saturday, from 12 p.m. to 2 a.m., the P7 lot, there will be music there uh, from, uh, let me find it. The music ends at 10 p.m., and uh, I believe the opening band is at noon, so it will be music there during the day, and then it uh, ends at 10. It will continue throughout the other events. So uh, um, we don't expect, it, it seems like uh, just a fun, cool event uh, for Royal Oak, and based on what we're doing, hopefully the timing is good uh, with what's going on right now as a kind of way to kick things back off once we get back to our the way things should be. Um, so any questions? I'm available. Questions for the chief? Um, the Royal Oak Celebration of the Arts is that Saturday, June 6th, um, at the middle school. It, has anyone in the course of any of these discussions realized that that is actually going to be taking place and maybe some efforts to kind of coordinate things? Or is this going to be news to the group that that's going to be taking place on that date? <clears throat> oh, that is a great question, and we will ask them. I, I wasn't aware that that was going on that day, but... Um, we can see if there's some sort of synergy with that, and there might be. I would think so. Um, I'm not sure who's heading up the committee for the celebration for the arts these days, but um, maybe tomorrow morning, if I make a note, I can email you at least the, the people who were talking about um, getting it organized for this year, and then you can maybe reach out to them sure. and find out whether or not they're interested in coordinating and creating the same kind of synergy. Sure. Okay. Um, I, I should point out that uh, on June 6th is also we're scheduled our uh, run with the police event, and we're actually pushing back the start time to kind of line up, and we're, we're hoping to get that same kind of synergy. So that, that event will still go on before the music starts at noon. Do you intend on running in that race? Um, I'll be faster than you, yes, Mayor. Guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Mr. Gillum. The gauntlet has been thrown down. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't um, know if I'm up to the challenge. I don't have much time to train this time. <laughs> to Commissioner Perusha's comment, uh, the DDA has agreed to serve as one of the sponsors of this blowout, and um, comments that were made at the DDA table when the sponsorship was approved was that the DDA wanted to see that <clears throat> the art component of this be a legitimate component, not just an afterthought. To the musical entertainment. Okay. So that message was conveyed to uh, the event promoters. So, um, and they seem to take that to heart. So, maybe there's a, a, a basis to, to tie in with the event you're talking about as well. So. I, yeah, I would think so because the the celebration showcases not only local musical groups like the Royal Oak Symphony and the Royal Oak Concert Band and other musical groups like that, but also the arts community, the, the visual art community. So there's displays of school art, there's the extraordinary artists that are taking classes at the Senior Center, some of whom are just incredible, most of whom are just incredible, displays throughout the, the middle school, the hallways and so on. So it's, it's, it's not just music, it's, it's also the visual arts as well. So to the extent that this event can, you know, highlight those aspects of it, that would be great. Because mm -hmm. um, it's because it's inside the school, um, it, you you have to get people to want to go inside the school, and that's difficult. That's been one of the biggest problems with the event. It's not out on the streets in the booths and everything. It's you have to go in the building, 
And when it's raining, that's great. But on other days, you'd rather be outside, and they, it's, there's, it's hard to get them to go inside. But if we can somehow create some connection and encourage them on through this, yeah. then that would be great. Good point. <clears throat> yeah, we can definitely uh, coordinate uh, through probably through Sean Kammer, the downtown manager for the DDA, who's kind of taking the point for the DDA on that. So okay. I'll pass this information along to him, too. Okay. So. All right. <clears throat> Commissioner Macy. I was just wondering, as a general matter, when we grant something like this, and then if there were something like going on right now with COVID-19, the way that we had with the St. Patrick's Day parade, what extent we can do something? Is there, do we have any controls on this once we've granted it or not? Yes, we can always cancel them if we have a legitimate reason to do that. Um, obviously, if the restaurants aren't open, they can't have it. Um, if we're not back to the way things should be in June, and I hate to say that, but if we're not, they do, they do want to maybe push it to October, but um, I'd rather move forward Co optimistically that we're going to get this happening in June. Uh, how much is the DDA sponsorship? Um, I'm not certain. I don't know if it's in the, in the uh, report or not. I, I don't recall. My, my concern here is uh, I, I know we all want this to be able to move forward. I, I don't have a whole lot of confidence here that we're going to be in a position to move forward on this in, in just over two months. And so I'm wondering whether it's prudent for us to approve this right now. Well, I would say that I think the chief actually brought up a very interesting point. I mean, one, if it's not um, the right time in June, then we pull it. Um, and if it is, then it might be a good opportunity to start to bring and incentivize people to come back to the downtown and really fold the uh, restaurants in and kind of, you know, the weather's turning, the quarantines are done, um, the bans have been lifted, and people can come out and celebrate a little bit and, and, and refrequent. And on honestly, I mean, the, on the promoter's dime. But is it the promoter's dime or is the DDA going to, is that money going to be gone? Well, if the DDA, if the event doesn't happen, then I imagine, I mean, the DDA would do its own contract, you know, and they'd have their own provisions in the contract, right, Mr. Gillum, where, you know, if they the event doesn't happen, obviously they don't pay the sponsorship. And if they do, and they, in their discretion, you know, knowing what's going on with all of the COVID-19 stuff, you know, they still made the recommendation based on their budget to look at this as, a, as an opportunity with their sponsorship. I think we have to sort of separate the DDA responsibility from our responsibility for the permit here today. But, I mean, your point, I'm not trying to invalidate your point. I'm just trying to explain a little bit maybe where the DDA is coming from. Mr. Oh. Mr. Gillum and then Commissioner Douglas. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, Commissioner Lavasso, I, ju I just pulled up the uh, DDA's agenda from their February meeting when the sponsorship agreement... <coughs> Um, was approved, it's a total of $50,000 that the DDA has pledged in terms of the sponsorship. Do we know whether that contract's been signed already? Um, I don't know for sure, but I would guess it has, <coughs> given that it was approved almost a month ago. All right. So, so certainly uh, the DDA may not be in a position now, given what we're seeing today, to protect themselves on that issue. Um, the paragraph in the contract, um, which I had reviewed, um, is entitled Termination, provides for termination by either party based upon a breach of the material provisions of the agreement, mutual agreement of the parties. There's also language in here, should the event be canceled or otherwise not occur, um, the event manager will refund all sponsorship funds provided by the DDA, less permit fees and non-refundable deposits. If an act of God or terrorist situation cancels the event, the DDA would not be refunded. Mr. Douglas. Chief, what accommodations are being made for the permit holders in uh, P7? I, for this event, we would do something very similar to what we did in other, give them spaces around their building most likely. but. That's something that with every event, uh, Sergeant Tykow works with the permit holders to make sure. I'm talking about the, from this, uh, the manner. manner yeah. Yes, those are the, yep. He'll work with them to resolve it. We're not going to need a lot of 
Citizen Like Arts Beats Needs, we need a lot of ancillary parking. We can block off some sections for them, or it's something ten or Sergeant Tycow would work out with them. Good, thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Any motions? The petitioner here. Maybe we want to hear from the um, petitioner. Mayor, the petitioner asked if they should come, and I suggest that they don't. I think that's okay. the advice we're giving. So <clears throat> no, that's fair. They don't come. That's fair. Uh, Commissioner Dubuck. Move for approval. Motion by Commissioner Dubuck. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Douglas. Mm. Discussion. Commissioner Lavasser. I, I can't support the motion at this time. It's again, it's uh, encouraging folks to congregate when at, at a time we are being told to. to provide some distance between ourselves. I, I think if this were a week ago, I, I think I could support it. Today, I can't. Commissioner Dubuck. I'm sorry, this is in June, right? Yeah. So there's plenty of time to cancel if we're still under a uh, social distancing yeah. advisor? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm sort of on the same boat that, you know, clearly we won't have it if, you know, the health and safety of our folks are at jeopardy at all, um, or if we have, you know, orders from the governor's office or the county's office and you know if not I don't want to you know we still have to you know factories are still running right now um, you know people are working in some capacities the best they can while adhering to the restrictions and I think it's incumbent upon us to make sure we do our job you know um, just like our auto factories are building cars anticipating that people are going to buy them and they're keeping forward we have to you know if we have a permit in front of us um, it makes sense to you know, move forward, and we have the right to pull it, like the chief said, in the event uh, there's a health issue. And I, and I think the promoter would <laughs> would do the same, um, you know, if people's health were at risk. So, uh, Commissioner Dubuck? Yeah, well, and I would add that, well, it's, it's entirely possible we're still under this order in June. Um, however, however long that time is, our businesses are really going to be feeling the pinch, and it's probably best for us to be able to hit the ground running as soon as the order is lifted and public safety has been restored. Uh, so we don't want it to end, and then it's going to take us months to do things that can benefit our businesses because we haven't been planning properly. I'd rather move forward with planning an event in June and pull the plug on it in May if we have to. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Okay. Motion passes. All right. Thank you, Chief. Um, this brings us to item number 10, which is the selection of the city manager. Mr. Gillum, do you want to at least kick us off a little bit here, and then I have some comments? I'd be happy to, Mr. Mayor. I mean, <clears throat> the commission has had uh, two rounds of interviews, the initial round with uh, five uh, semifinalists, if you will, for the position of city manager, uh, culminating <coughs> in the uh, second round of three candidates this past Thursday, along with the uh, interviews that the commission conducted on Thursday. <coughs> we also had uh, meet and greet sessions, if you will, informal opportunities for uh, first the department heads and then also uh, the general employees to have a chance to meet and speak with um, the three candidates. Uh, the employees um, both and the department heads, both groups were given comment cards that uh, were copied and provided to you um, after. Um, those sessions were complete before you conducted your interviews on Thursday night. In addition, given the, um, the issues with uh, the coronavirus, we had canceled the public meet and greet that was scheduled for immediately before the interviews, but um, we did get the word out and we did set up um, a survey monkey for comments to be provided um, to the commission um, by the public after the interviews were posted on the website on Friday based upon the video of the interviews. So in looking at the, uh, uh, the results of the survey this afternoon, I'm sure you all have too, we received many comments about all three of the candidates. So that's the information that you have along with the other information that James Petrano from GovHR had compiled for you. Um, we would be looking for uh, the commission to make a decision tonight and to off make a conditional offer of employment to the candidate of your choice, the uh, offer being conditioned upon, in no particular order, um, a full background investigation, a physical examination, and also a successful uh, negotiation of the terms of a contract. 
that would be acceptable to both the City Commission and the candidate, which we would be bringing back to the City Commission for formal approval at a subsequent meeting, possibly as early as uh, our meeting in two weeks. That's, that's our goal anyway. So. Any questions? All right. Well, what I'd like to do, I think what worked very well last time when we were narrowing down the list to our next candidates to interview for a second interview is that we kind of all went around the table and we had the opportunity to kind of see where our heads at before we get a lot of motions on the table and things bouncing around to kind of, you know, kick off the discussion with just going around and, and saying, you know, what we thought of the process, where we what we think of the candidates and, and where we're sort of uh, falling into place as individuals. Um, I'd like to do that again tonight. Uh, and, you know, so I'm, I'm going to see if we can go around the table, um, kind of give our, our feedback to each other. And, you know, if we can hold off from making any motions till everyone's had a chance to speak, I think that would be helpful. So um, I guess we'll start down here with Commissioner Gibbs. You know, maybe um, kind of let us know what your thoughts are, who who you think would be the best fit, and we'll kind of work our way down. I narrowed my decision down to Eric Tungate. Okay. He has a vested interest in the job. He lives here. Okay. Right? Yes, he does live here. Yeah. Any other thoughts or just... Oh. Okay. Commissioner Douglas? Um, we are... <laughs> We should be the envy of other cities around Michigan at having three such qualified candidates uh, to choose from. Um, they all presented very well in both of their interviews. They all bring valuable qualities to the table. To the table, um, and I'll just comment a little bit on on them as individuals. Um, I thought uh, Dr. Mitchell. Um, made a number of points that I, I thought were are important to our city. She talked about uh, priority-based budgeting. Um, it sounded like um, she had a good a way of uh, giving a vision to her employees and inspiring others to meet it, um, that she built a good, built good teamwork with the people who work for her. Um, uh, Mr. Tungate is a, a but I will say that I think Dr. Mitchell's experience, she's spent six years as, city, as a city manager in communities much smaller than ours. Um, and I, I, just, I just did not feel that her um, experience rose to the level of the other two. So I've narrowed my choice to, to either Mr. Tungate or Mr. Brake. Um, and I looked at four different, I mean, the, my priorities were as follows, employee relations, strategic communications, planning, especially regarding housing, and um, seniors. Um, and um, so I thought all of the candidates had a thoughtful, philosophical approach to supervising others. Um, the, the fact that you could make anonymous online comments and no disgruntled employees from any other city took a, advantage of the opportunity to diss their former boss, I thought was promising. Um, I will point out that, and I put a lot of value in those city employees who participated in the meet and greet, um, and of those who provided comment cards, there were 12 positive comments about the three candidates. Seven of them praised Mr. Brake, com you know, completely without prompting. I thought that was promising. When it comes to communications, Mr. Tungay is an eloquent and compelling speaker and would be great as our city's spokesperson, and that's important to me. Um, I think Mr. Brake uh, would also be an excellent spokesperson for the city. Um, I think he approaches communications from a higher level, a more strategic level. He talked about using the city's goals as a framework for messaging and using the city's communication staff. Um, he sees, I, I think he sees communication as a process to be managed, and I appreciate that more strategic approach. Planning is important to me. I know Mr. Tungate has a great track record in um, planning in his community and a great passion for it. Um, all of the candidates describe their approaches for creating attainable housing in their communities. Um, Mr. Tungate called for a housing policy. Mr. Brake, however, was the only men one who mentioned the city's master plan as the guiding document for such a policy, and I think that's the proper place for that decision-making to, to come from, and, and I agree with him on that. 
All of the candidates were asked about responding to the growing percentage of 65 or older people in our population. Um, Mr. Brake, however, was the only one who referred to the AARP age-friendly communities process that the city is currently engaged in. So anecdotally, I, the city is now looking for fellows, which elsewhere are called interns, right? And uh, we're advertising for somebody with a master's degree or a master's candidate to make $15 an hour <coughs> as, a, as a fellow. And I had a friend say, what kind of job, you know, and what kind of job does somebody with a master's degree make $15 an hour? Um, and <clears throat> my response was that city management, unlike even corporate management, requires a great deal of experience. Um, it's, it's a job with new challenges every day and solutions for those challenges aren't found in a textbook, they're found in experience. Um, to me, Paul breaks 24 years of specific experience make him the superior candidate. That's where, I, that's where I will go. I think Mr. Tungate is great and if the will of the commission is, is, on, is in behalf of Mr. Tungate, I will vote for him happily, um, but my preference is for Paul Brake. Commissioner Dubuck. Uh, I think that was a, a, an awesome summary of, of the three you know, really qualified candidates we have before us. I agree with Commissioner Douglas that you know, we're lucky to have a difficult decision to make. Um, as I've thought about this over you know, the last few days and the, the couple weeks before that, um, and kind of reassessing the answers and, and how our Q&A went and going back over their, their credentials and their resumes and all the information we asked them to provide, my Prefer, my preferred candidate has kept switching as I thought about it. So I've been really trying to lock it down um, on something that I feel like is, is solid for me. And so while I think they all bring a um, you know, really valuable skill set to the table and any one of them would be, I think, uh, a fine uh, manager for our city, um, the way that I broke this never-ending time I had was I thought when uh, Mr. Brake came out of the gate, really giving us a breakdown of Morgantown, um, that gave me a lot more insight into who he is and the similarities between that and this city and what he's bringing to the table. So, you know, originally we were looking at it and, you know, it's a slightly smaller city, but talking about it being a college town where the population spikes and swells at certain times of day, certain times of year, that's very similar to our city. Um, it's being a college town and being like the town with kind of like the draw of West Virginia, right? The, not a lot of sports teams or anything, but in West Virginia, the university is like the brand, right? So um, all the varying interests and stakeholders and all these folks who are vested in the future of that city, um, all with their own you know, different agendas and being able to pull together those stakeholders is very much similar to our experience and our needs here in Royal Oak. Um, so I thought that that was kind of unique compared um, to the, uh, the communities uh, others are, are, are coming from. Um, he, he was the only one that, in, in his written materials, uh, front-loaded environmental sustainability as projects that he's really proud of. Um, and they all spoke you know, pretty well to environmental, environmental sustainability and the importance of it when we, when we questioned about it, but uh, without being prompted, it was already in his written materials. And so I, that you know, was, was meaningful to me. And then lastly, well, I really appreciate the, the comments, a uh, public comment about you know, someone who's here now Right. And, and, and knows the history of our community, currently resides here, knows um, you know, what, what pains they might feel as a resident. Um, there's also incredible value in bringing in an outside view to things. And I thought Mr. Brick, in, in his second interview, um, did a great job of, of you know, highlighting like challenging assumptions being kind of a central piece of his leadership. And... Uh, you know, I thought that brought value as well. So, and that's not to disparage, you know, Dr. Mitchell or, or Mr. Tungate. I think, you know, they interviewed very well. You know, they brought energy and vision, and clearly a caliber of leadership that you know is is um, you know, qualifies them to lead our city. But in really struggling to identify what are the things that set someone apart for me, um, those are the ones that I, I really came up with that that spoke to me the most. So, um, he is at the top of my list. Although, you know, like others, I, I think they are. They're all very qualified, and um, I'm, I'm happy to engage in discussion with you all about it. Thank you, Commissioner DeBuck. Um, I guess it's my turn. I mean, I, I think that all the colleagues here uh, for me um, have said some, some pretty interesting things. Um, like everyone, I think it goes without saying, we're very fortunate to have three very uh, highly qualified uh, candidates. In fact, um, 
you know, I came from a place of also switching, you know, I mean, talking like Milla factors related to um, uh, each person. And, and I think that came down to the fact that um, each candidate is very unique uh, in what they can bring to the table. Uh, they're unique in their terms of skill set, and they're unique in their terms of their management style, and unique in terms of um, you know things that they've uh, experienced and, and, and what drives them and what moves them forward. Um, I don't object to any of them, uh, you know, uh, strongly at all. So you know, I'm interested to hear what my colleagues have to say. But you know, one candidate, you know, um, I, I think, you know. A couple of the, the, the local candidates clearly um, can hit the ground running without a doubt because they understand the Michigan you know, financial situation. They understand um, how the laws work, how, how everything works. Um, and I think that, that is a meaningful attribute. But I also think, too, um, we have a pretty strong staff here today. We have a strong finance department. Uh, we have tenure among people here in the city. Um, many of us have been up here. Uh, Commissioner Perush has been up here a couple different times uh, with many years of experience. Just be very careful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when it, in terms of a, in terms of a stable city commission, I think you know we we all of us here have been you know uh, here for a while. Even the newcomers have been here for a couple years. Um, and I mean, I think Kyle and I are going on what nine years. Nine you know, years. sitting at this table, living through a great recession, seeing a lot of things. Uh, Mr. Gillum has been here. Uh, and he doesn't plan to go unless we don't hire a city manager, and then I fear we may lose his capacity as a city attorney. Um, so I, I think that, you know, when I look at, you know, what came down for me to kind of edge towards one individual was, um, which, which is hard, and I still am waffling a little bit, is really about the next chapter of Royal Oak, and, and not so much about what the other candidates don't bring, because I think all of them would do a very competent job. I think it's more about, you know, what's that one unique thing that we can bring? And I think um, Commissioner Dubuck, Commissioner Douglas hit the nail on the head with a, a few different things. I think having a unique outside perspective is important. I think, um, you know, the questions regarding innovation uh, and, and how to do things differently and bringing in those different perspectives, I think Mr. Brake can do that. I mean, even some of his background with, um, you know, um, his educational background, uh, where he's worked in the past and the relationships he has within the Michigan Municipal League and other agencies around the area. I think that he, um, you know, for me, there's that little bit of um, difference or separation. But I'm interested to hear what my other colleagues say. Um, and, and honestly, everyone was coming out the same for me, but I was trying to look for one unique characteristic uh, that um, one of the candidates could bring. And that's kind of where at least right now, where my head is is lying. So, Commissioner Perush? Um, I have to be very honest that at 5 o'clock this afternoon, I wasn't really sure what I was going to say because I think like the rest of us, we all recognize that we have three extraordinary individuals here. They're all different. They all bring different skills to the table and different levels of experience, different backgrounds. Um, but, but they're all extraordinary candidates. I would be very happy to work um, with any one of the three. Um, I think uh, they're all very, very talented and they would serve our city very well. So then it came down to um, hair splitting, <laughs> which I think we've all been doing, is, is if we have three extraordinary candidates, what is enough to set one above the others? And I also have to be honest that I think if we were making the decision six months ago or six weeks ago or even six days ago, we might be looking at a different candidate because things have so radically changed in the last 24 hours, six days. I mean, the world is essentially turned upside down. Um, and I think that change in circumstances is what as I was, you know, reading the news reports, again, you, you kind of check your phone every half hour to see what new catastrophe is happening. Um, I think that world situation is what pushed me into uh, making this election that I did. And I also um, think that at this point in time, Mr. Brake is, is the best choice because of his experience, um, because of his uh, work in a community that 
as others have said, effectively is the same size as ours. It grows to our population size uh, when the college is in session. Um, and because of his experience and the various other um, things that we have considered important in terms of the criteria that we set out originally, community communication, importance of involving neighborhoods with um, major decisions, which he did um, very effectively in terms of the various projects that were going on, the hospital and so on. Um, environmental sustainability. Um, so he hit all the right buttons in terms of those issues that we had identified, but so did the other candidates. Uh, but then when I look at it in terms of what we are going to need to do as a community going forward and as a county and as a state, as a nation, in order to put ourselves back together whenever this virus emergency ends, and even on a going forward basis, because it's not going to end tomorrow, um, we need someone with, with, with long-term experience in dealing with multiple, multiple actors within the community, um, with a calm demeanor, with with, with uh, just a, a good concept of how we all need to work together in order to make things happen, in order to make things right again. And we're gonna need that, we're gonna really need that. And so based upon my um, gut feeling as to who is best to carry us forward through that process, um, it's, it's Mr. Brake. But I will say that again, that if the choice is someone else, I could be very, very happy with either of the other two. Dr. Mitchell is extraordinary, and she will have a great career if she doesn't end up here, and so will Mr. Tungate. Uh, they will both move forward and do great things. But I think for us right now, my choice would be uh, Mr. Brake. Thank you. Commissioner Pruch, Commissioner Macy. Uh, <clears throat> so when I was looking at this, and I rewatched all of the interviews again this weekend, um, I was listening to them talking about their leadership style. I was listening to them talk about their vision for their city, their ideas, the innovation, what they'd be bringing, um, how they would act as a communicator to our residents, how they would reach out to our residents, what they would be focusing on in our city. Um, and you, you, there were pros and cons for all of them. I think we've all said it every time, is that you go for one, and then you think maybe this next one. And I flipped, I flipped a lot of times. Um, in the end, what I think I decided that I valued most about the person who would be on the city, the city manager would be someone who would be really good at building relationships. And I don't just mean relationships up here, but also relationships with, with the residents, relationships with the media, um, relationships with their employees, which they would have a lot of. And for me, that's what I looked at the most. And I really valued the comments that we received, both from our employees, um, who, are, <coughs> who got to meet, them at, meet the candidates at the meeting greets, and we got a, a number, more than 50 comments from people who were, had watched the interviews over the weekend uh, with feedback. And it's amazing that we got no negative comments from any disgruntled employees. And to me, it was kind of, blow, I was blown away by how many positive comments from past employees we got for Dr. Mitchell. Um, and that, that spoke a lot to me, and I was very impressed by that. All three candidates had many, many positive things said about them. Um, and I think I've heard from here tonight that there's concern that Dr. Mitchell doesn't have you know, quite, the, quite the same kind of experience that the other two candidates have. I tend to think women hustle harder. She could have done it. Um, but I see the way the wind is blowing. And I, I have to agree that when I'm sizing up the candidates um, and I'm thinking about building relationships and who will be strongest at that, I was m most impressed with Mr. Brake and how he had a very favorable as um, Commissioner Douglas noted he had the most favorable feedback from our own employees, and that's very important to me. So that's my candidate for this as well. Commissioner Levasseur. Uh, for, for me, I thought all three candidates were extremely strong. I think any of, those, uh, any of the three candidates would be uh, a, a very good city manager for the city of Royal Oak. Uh, for me, uh, uh, the one candidate that stood out uh, was Mr. Tungate uh, for three basic reasons. Uh, number one, uh, I think he's a tremendous communicator. He would be a tremendous uh, spokesperson promoting the city of Royal Oak. Uh, I think that's absolutely tremendous. And that comes from number two, he has a passion for our city. He's a resident of the city. Uh, you can tell from, from uh, his discussion with us, uh, he's not looking for any other job uh, other than this job right here. This is where he wants to be. This is where he has a passion for. He loves this city already. He doesn't have to learn to love it. Uh, number three, and, and you know, 
all, all three of the candidates may have skills here, uh, but uh, th there's things that Mr. Tungate said that resonated with me with regard to his skills dealing with the finances of a city. Uh, you know, he went into a very difficult situation in the city of Oak Park, uh, a city that was facing a uh, emergency manager potentially, uh, and uh, uh, by all indications, that city is doing extremely well now. Uh, he spoke specifically about very specific ways that uh, uh, he took action, the city took action to uh, uh, cut costs, uh, whether it was cut bond costs by refinancing or as simple as uh, changing the bulbs and streetlights to reduce energy costs. Uh, he talked about uh, being on course to have uh, 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 retirement accounts fully funded within a certain period of time. So that, that was a focus that he had that I picked up that perhaps the others have those skills as well. Perhaps they've dealt with it as well. I didn't pick it up as much from them in their discussions as I did with Mr. Tungay. Mr. Tungay would be my choice. Thank you, Commissioner Levesque. Okay. Well, I mean, I think that was productive that we kind of know where everybody is standing or waffling a little bit. So um, I think, as Mr. Gillum said, the next step is to make a motion to um, pick an individual for your office to prepare and start the negotiations uh, with an offer of employment, correct? <clears throat> That's correct. I, I spoke with uh, <clears throat> um, with James Vitrano this afternoon, and um, after the meeting is over tonight, I will, uh, depending what time it is, either call him or send him an email to let him know what action the commission took. He will then reach out to the three candidates Individually, he will notify the one who's been chosen and uh, express his appreciation to the other two who have not been chosen. Um, he'll let me know once he's made those contacts. <clears throat> then I'll be reaching out to the successful candidate um, just initially to confirm um, the selection. And then over the next couple days, um, we'll be working together to put together a uh, uh, when I say we internally, Mr. Vandalar, myself, probably Mr. Shipman, to put together basically a, a, an initial draft of some terms that we'll present to the candidate <coughs> for their response and reaction, and then, <coughs> excuse me, then the negotiations will for, go forward from there. Okay. But given that we're talking about three experienced city managers, um, neither Mr. Vitrano nor I seem to think that these will be long protracted negotiations. Commissioner Douglas? Yes, I would move to direct the uh, city attorney to extend an offer on employment to Paul Brake um, and to begin salary negotiations and as those proceed satisfactorily to conduct the necessary background checks. Motion by Commissioner Douglas. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Perouche. Um, Mr. Gillum? And just to clarify, Commissioner Douglas, then we're talking about a conditional offer of employment with the conditions being the background check, the physical examination and then successful contract negotiation. Yes. Thank you. Discussion. Uh, we'll go with Commissioner Perush and then Commissioner Levasseur. I would just ask that you ask um, Mr. Lepre Mr. Um, Petrano when he talks to the three candidates, especially if it turns out that it is Mr. Brake is the choice, the other two candidates, make sure that he expresses, number one, our appreciation for them, for their their efforts to go through this process. And number two, make sure that they understand that it was an extraordinarily difficult decision, that we're talking about hair breadths here of, of distinctions and differences um, between these candidates for the most part, and that um, we wish them all well in their, in their careers um, because we think that they're extraordinary people um, and that it was a tough decision. Could you make sure that he lets them know that? I will, absolutely. And, and for what it's worth, having sat through all the interviews myself and then observing the meet and greet, I'm glad it's a decision that the seven of you had to make and not me. So. It's much less stressful for the city attorney. I don't know about the interim manager, but the city attorney is. <laughs> so. I, I learned a long time ago to count, and I, I did count four uh, people who had glowing praise for Mr. Brake, indicating that he was their first choice. Uh, as I indicated, Mr. Tungate would be my choice. I, I think Mr. Brake would be a tremendous choice. 
uh, I will support the motion because I think it's important to show confidence in the new person that you're going to hire, even though I've expressed that Mr. Tongate would have been my choice. But I do think tremendously of, of Mr. Brake as well. Thank you, Commissioner Obasso. Commissioner Gibbs? And I, have, I really <clears throat> liked the interaction with all three candidates. I think any of the three would be perfect. Maybe not perfect. Really close to perfect. No such thing as perfect. Um, and Mr. Tungate was my first choice, but I was very happy with the other two candidates, and I'm happy to extend an offer to Mr. Brake, providing that's the way the motion vote goes. <laughs> Mr. Macy? Um, what's the physical exam? It's a pre-employment physical, the same that any... City employee. Just like a health take. exam. Can you lift yeah. up not, a stapler? Not like they have to run a mile in a certain amount of time. No. All right. Unless you, unless you want us to ask <laughs> yeah. no. chief, chief out there. We don't even do that for the chief. the chief. I got stories about that. <laughs> 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 yeah. Make sure they're not flat footed or anything like that. Yeah. Just a standard pre employment uh, physical. Got it. Mr. Dubuck? Oh, yes. Yeah, so we're getting close to at least wrapping up our piece of this process. I just want to say, what a, how wonderfully I think this has gone with the caliber of candidates that came forward, um, how things went with the consultant, uh, everyone interviewed so well, and, and I want to, you know, uh, Commissioner Lavasser and Commissioner Gibbs, like everything you said is part of my calculation. Like everything you said is absolutely right. You know, that's what's so hard about this. Um, and so I landed where I landed because of the reasons I said, but I, that's where I'm at. <laughs> but I, I, I'm not like 100% certain I'm right, but I feel like we're going the right direction given that. We all independently landed somewhat in the same place. Um, so thanks to everybody for going through this. This has been not as painful as I would have thought. <laughs> it's such a huge decision. This is such a big deal for our city. So, and, and I just have to confess that, you know, no matter who was nominated, I would have voted for him. I mean, I think it's, you know, I think, I mean, I, I guess that sounds like bad leadership in my uh, point of view, but, you know, I think that, um, you know, we got some challenging times ahead of us, and if we could get all three of them on board, that would be amazing, because I think they all bring something different that would, you know, help us face not only what we have today going on with the impacts of COVID-19, but also, you know, we saw the Dow plummet 3,000 points. Uh, we're seeing retailers, Art Van, going out of business. I mean, we're. I mean, the the bull the bull market is done. The bear market is here. It's probably a few years too late. We've done a pretty darn good job with the staff that we've had preparing as best we can. So I'm confident that um, you know if this vote goes well, Mr. Brake will take over a city that is in the best possible shape. But nonetheless, um, we can see the clouds ahead, and you know we're going to need someone on board to start to you know, tighten up the sails and get the crew in order to, you know, um, help us uh, navigate, you know, what's on the horizon here. So, which is the nature of life, the nature of business, the nature of city government, the nature of, of you know, just being present. So um, I'll be supporting the motion, and, and I guess if there's no other comments, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes. Okay, we'll look to hear from you, Mr. Gillum. I will keep you posted. Thank you. This brings us to item number 11. We just have three items outside our regular agenda that were added tonight. Um, I wanted to have a little discussion on uh, COVID-19, specifically um, city operations. I think that, you know, a lot of things have transpired here even as of today. Um, and I think it's important that, you know, since we're all here anyways, that we talk a little bit about uh, some of the things we've done. Um, obviously, last meeting we, we went through and, and the city has made great strides so far to ensure the, the health and safety of the public erring on the side of caution. Um, but, you know, there's still some things that, you know, potentially, um, you know, we need to make a decision on. I know um, our staff uh, from our police chief uh, and our uh, fire chief, HR, everybody, I know Mr. Gillum has been working with department heads uh, over the weekend and... Um, you know, trying to look at every element to see what, you know, if we do get the order or we do find it in our judgment to um, limit city operations, uh, what would that mean? How would we do it? 
Um, maybe we don't have all the answers, but at least we have a framework or, or a, a beginning plan that we can work with. And I know he's worked very hard, and I even had discussions with Mr. Gillum over the weekend to check in and see how things were going. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd like to see what the um, commission thinks here. Um, I know some cities have shut down, uh, you know, public access to the city hall. The Secretary of State has done some things as well. Clearly, our number one priority is being part of the solution, not part of the problem, making sure we, our citizens are healthy, but, you know, up there equally are the people that, you know, are in public service that serve the city honorably day in and day out, and making sure we manage that risk uh, as well. And we look to the long term, uh, not the, um, you know, the immediate service needs that we may have to provide. Um, so wanted to add that to the agenda to see what, you know, my colleagues think and what we might need or want to do. Mr. Gillum? Here, if I could maybe jump in and, and for, for your benefit, and I guess maybe for the benefit of the, the people in the audience and the people at home, to give you an idea of what we have done so yeah, far. Yeah, that would be that would be very good <clears throat> to do that. Yep. To kind of recap, I mean, as soon as we became aware last week that um, we had <coughs> confirmed cases of COVID-19 here in the state of Michigan, um, and then <clears throat> shortly thereafter that the governor had issued the executive order putting a cap on the number of, of people that were supposed to be in a gathering at 250 and probably more significantly indicating that as of today that all the schools in the state were going to be closed. Um, we waited, we wanted to get, make sure we had all the information. Um, I waited to have a, a full meeting with the staff until after um, Friday morning when the county executive office and the health department had provided a telephone update for anyone who was interested, and I was right at the, the head of the line as far as that's concerned. After gathering what I thought was all the current information at that point in time, I met with the staff, and we did make some changes um, effective as of Friday. Um, in no particular order, <clears throat> um, we identified um, basically three or four core senior services that we felt that could be uh, maintained with the current staffing and still maintain a safe environment out at the Mahaney Manager Senior Center, Senior Senior Center. So with the exception of those programs that we felt that we could maintain, all the other senior programs have been canceled indefinitely at this point in time. Um, along the same lines in, in dovetail with the timelines that had been set um, by the governor for the closing of the schools, um, We've canceled all the city's recreation programs, um, both at uh, the school facilities, which were now going to be closed, um, but also <coughs> over at uh, the Salter Center as well, because um, there wasn't going to be staff there to run those activities anymore. So um, <coughs> through April 12th, um, all of the city's recreation programs have been canceled. Um, and that includes activities at the ice arena, um, the ice arena was closed over the weekend. Um, we had had some discussions with the representatives from Suburban Management Company on Friday. They said they were having a meeting later in the day on Friday. They wanted us to loop back with them today. As soon as I got in this morning, uh, Recreation Director John Fidelli had already reached out to them, but in light of the decisions that the governor had <coughs> made over the weekend and some other factors, a suburban had already made the decision to close down all of their facilities. So the ice arena is closed now as well. Um, in terms of what we've done with the staff, um, again, in no particular order, um, we've canceled essentially all of the remaining meetings for the city boards, commissions, committees um, for the rest of the month, um, with the exception of tonight's meeting, for example, and a couple other meetings this week that um, have some, <coughs> some pressing matters on their agendas. Um, but with the exception of that, other meetings have been canceled. The Planning Commission meeting um, that was scheduled for Wednesday night, the Commission for the Arts meeting that was scheduled for Wednesday night, um, other meetings, those have all been canceled. Um, I want to have some follow-up discussion about that, about the meetings that we have scheduled for the rest of the month. But um, I'll get back to those in a second. Um, in terms of, of the staff themselves, um, we all encourage staff members, subject to the approval of their department heads, to go ahead and work remotely, to work from home, if they're able to do that, and if the department is still able to maintain their operations. 
Um, we've encouraged uh, staff, if necessary, to take time off to care for their kids with the schools closing. Um, there are a number of employees that don't have any other options. And so either they, they or their spouses or both at some point are gonna be, have to be taking time off. So we've encouraged them to do that as needed. We've indicated that we will um, work with them as much as we possibly can to allow them to use whatever bank time they have. If um, they don't have bank time or they don't have enough bank time, um, we'll work with them when the, within the context of our collective bargaining agreements to either advance them sick leave time or advance them vacation time. Um, in addition, there is also legislation that's pending in Washington. Uh, it's been approved in the House. It's still working its way through the process in the Senate, in the Senate that could extend additional benefits to our employees. So um, we're keeping a very close eye on that because that's going to affect uh, the decisions that we make and what we're able to do for our employees going forward. So um, in the building department, um, the building department is somewhat unique in the sense that that's with the exception of our first responders who, God bless them, they're going to have to keep doing their job every day no matter what. Um, but um, the building department is the only other uh, group, and I guess suppose, suppose maybe to a certain extent the assessor's office, but they don't have the same time sensitivity that the building department does. That's one of the only areas where <laughs> we actually have to send city employees into existing facilities, into people's homes and things like that. So there are special risks that those employees are facing in the current environment. So um, they're in the process of developing certain priorities as to which inspections they're going to go ahead and continue to handle as they always have and other ones that they're going to be able to maybe defer on. And uh, those changes, I'm told anecdotally, have been very well received by the public so far. The, the priorities that, that we seem to be setting in the building department seem to be well received by the public and everybody understands where we're coming from. So um, that's kind of where we're at right now. We're prepared to go forward and continue to operate in that fashion. Um, and that's kind of where we were um, Friday when I finally left here at 6.30 or 7 o'clock at night, whatever it was. Um, but obviously things have, have changed over the weekend. Um, there are additional orders that have come down from the governor's office. There's additional discussion about other orders coming from the, the health department. Um, given the fact that we're increasing testing for the virus, the number of positives um, in the state of Michigan has continued to rise. And I'm not a doctor, but I would expect will continue to rise. So with that in mind, I mean, I recognize that there are other governmental entities that have done the same kind of things that we've done, but there are other communities that are announcing doing additional things. Um, there are a number of communities now that have decided to completely close their facilities to the public. Um, I believe the county is going to be doing that tomorrow. I'm not sure. I looked on the website late this afternoon. I didn't see anything, but that's what I've been told by one of the staff that was out there at the county today. Um, I believe the city of Troy has done that. I think the city of Madison Heights has done that. Um, and uh, communities in other areas throughout the state. So, I mean, that's something we could possibly do if, if that is the case. Um, we would do that in the interest of, of course, protecting the public, um, to minimizing the contact that the public has um, coming into the building and things like that, but also um, to protect our, our employees as well. Um, the less contact that they have with the public, that breaks both ways. That's to, to both of their benefits. So um, we would be encouraging people to... Um, um, we're, we're not talking about closing City Hall down necessarily, but um, just closing the building to the public. So with the exception of the employees that are going to be working from home and those that are going to be home taking care of their kids, the rest of us would be here and would be working. Um, so we'd be here to respond to phone calls. We'd be here to take emails from the public um, as much as we possibly could to carry on the regular functions and continue to provide service to the public as best that we can. So we would be encouraging people to call us, to email us, <clears throat> to rely on the website, um, to generally rely on the Internet. Um, any payments that need to be made could be made electronically. Um, they could use the drop boxes here to make those payments. And I think our position would be that we'll be very forgiving in terms of any payments that are tardy or delinquent. <coughs> 
the payments that were due during the period of time that we're, we're going through this new normal, if you will. Um, <clears throat> and, and then we'll, we'll continue to do all the same things that I, we're continuing to do. Um, again, we should talk about our meeting schedules. Um, I'm told I was on a phone conference this afternoon sponsored by the MML um, with representatives from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And what the MML rep indicated during the phone conference was <clears throat> that there are rumors that either the governor's office or the state legislature is going to make some, some changes or some modifications to the Open Meetings Act, which will allow us to conduct our meetings remotely. Oh. So people wouldn't have to come and be in the same room. Members of the public would potentially be able to monitor um, meetings um, from home and then possibly even provide comment during the course of the meeting. We'd have to work out some of those details. So <clears throat> we might be able to, we might have a workaround as far as the meetings are concerned, but that still remains to be seen. The bottom line is if there are other things that the City Commission would like us to do, we can try to do those. If the Commission's preference is to go out and close down all city properties, we can do that effective as of tomorrow. <clears throat> if you aren't comfortable doing that right now, we'll continue to plug away in the same way that we have right now. Um, again, it's really your decision as to how you want us to proceed going forward for the rest of this week. Anyway, it's, it's a very fluid situation. It changes, I think, as the Mayor said, just about every hour. Um, and we're trying to be fluid. Um, we're trying to maintain a level of service. We're trying to let the public know that we're here. Um, we're all going to work through this. You don't need to be panic, but we all need to be aware of what's going on, and we need to take steps, whatever we can reasonably, to try to minimize the risk to everybody involved. Uh, well, Commissioner Macy and then Commissioner Gibbs. So I have a comment and then a question. My comment is that uh, I don't think you mentioned we did close the library. The library board had an emergency meeting on Friday, and as of 6 p.m. on Friday, the library is closed to the public, and people are allowed to work from home. They're working in with our library director to figure out how that's going to work for them. Um, and then my question was about what City Hall has been looking like these last few days when you've been allowing there to be some remote work, because uh, the new directive is now we should not gather in more than 10 keeps going down that number, and I'm wondering if you're seeing departments where there are more than 10 people or if it's really pretty pared <coughs> down at this point. Um, <clears throat> first, as to the library, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, the, the, as I understand, the, the board did vote Friday to close down. The library is closed. I just did mention that because yeah, I, yeah. I wasn't going to try to take credit for that. That's something <laughs> the library board did. <laughs> so, and, and along the same lines, I would indicate, too, um, that um, I spoke with Judge Meineke. Actually, we traded voicemails yesterday. But as of today, the, the district court is also closed, too, yeah. based upon direction that the court received from the Michigan Supreme Court and the <coughs> Supreme Court Administrator's <coughs> Office. They're going to be operating on a very much, much reduced schedule for, uh, the, the judge indicated to me, for maybe <coughs> even as long as a month. So everybody, um, in terms of all the, the, the city organizations and the city entities, everybody's trying to take steps. So. Um, I mean, I think um, the, the hallways have definitely been a lot less crowded um, than they have been recently, not even including the election next week, last week. But, um, and I think I've, there are still a number of employees here, here. Um, I think there are a number of employees that um, are in the process of trying to be able to prepare to work from home, mm -hmm. but we need to get all the IT details worked out. And I think at least one or two of the mm -hmm. employees in IT were working frantically today to try to get all the protocols set up so more people would have access to the city's network from home. So I think um, the number of city employees is here that, that are here I think is going to drop significantly anyway, regardless of whether or not we stay open or we stay closed. Um, but um, I think, candidly, I think if the building is closed, I think a lot of the employees that are here would probably breathe a sigh of relief. Yeah. So within, even within the departments and where they sit, is it possible to have them all sitting six feet apart? That, is that even a feasible thing? Um, <clears throat> generally speaking, I, I think it, it probably is, or more or less. Okay. I mean, candidly, we probably can accommodate that a little bit better at this building than we're going to be able to at the new building across the street. Don't say that. 
but um, hopefully this will be a, That's a, ironic. This, this will be a, 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 a bad dream by the time we move across the street. So I don't know. For example, I looked at Ms. Hallis. I mean, she has a number of employees down in her office. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you've probably got room down there. You could probably move people six feet apart if that's what they wanted. Maybe away from the window then. Yeah. But, okay. Commissioner Gibbs? I think um, scaling back is a very responsible thing to do. I don't think, though, sorry to staff, <laughs> um, completely deadbolting the building would be a good idea because there are still things that people are going to need to discuss or what if their water isn't working or something is something odd is coming out of their faucet. You know what I mean? We, we do need to have a staff, um, maybe a minimum staff, working for emergencies and somebody's got to empty the boxes, the drop boxes. You know what I mean? We can't leave checks sitting in there. Um, but I, I do know that, for example, the clerk's office, they're very close together. And I don't know that you could be six feet apart from each other. They're not addressing the window there. Huh? Hmm? Well, I said if they're, if they're not working the counter, you know, if you look, they're, I mean, mostly six feet apart. And I would argue that some of them could even move to another location within the building if they needed to. Um, well, that that being said, maybe that 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 can be done. Um, but if people decided to not work because they are also caring for parents, you know, that that's a risk group, parents and babies, just like we were told in the in, in closed session um, from the attorney. I think if they wanted to take some vacation time, I think that should be very allowed. I, I, I don't think there should be people who are in those kinds of situations should be faulted for having to take off be, or work from home. I, and I, I don't know how that's set up. I just know... I have my phone, and that's how I communicate with the city. But yeah, I'll just, I mean, I think, you know, to kind of go off what Commissioner Gibbs is saying, I think <clears throat> that, you know, we're not, I don't think any of us are arguing or petitioning for like a zero, you know, isolation. Nobody comes to City Hall. I think it's all about mitigation. And, you know, I think closing City Hall to the public does a couple things. Um, I think most things can be done online, even the clerk's office. I'll let Ms. Hallis answer that. You know, most things can be done online um, or over the phone if there's a question or there's an issue. And I think anything in the unique cases that merit a face-to-face -face or more depth, I mean, those can be pushed off. Most of those are just monetary issues or, you know, things we can, as department heads and intelligent people, give some sort of dispensation or waiver in those unique cases. I also think the traffic to City Hall is naturally going to be lower as well. So the work will be less demanding. And I think, you know, when you think about building permits and all of that um, and other issues, I mean, there are, th this isn't just affecting the um, resident-city relationship. Um, you have uh, folks that aren't, you know, scrambling to open up businesses or scrambling to, you know, pull <coughs> permits or their, you know, legal firm isn't working and they can't get something in for zoning or whatever it may be. So you're going to see a natural decrease in the, in the things. Um, I think some of the things we can do, you know, um, uh, remotely off-site, I think some of the things we can do without actually opening up the doors of our um, city hall, I mean, businesses are doing that right now. If you look at the big three, they're all, um, you know, working remotely. But there are some crews working dinos and a few things that, you know, you can't do remotely. So I think there's reasonable things we can do to go from a risk factor of X to a risk factor of something significantly less than X, but you're never going to get it to zero um, because you know you're you're just you're going to halt everything to a complete standstill. So, um, what are the low hanging fruit? What are the reasonable things that we can do? Um, you know, for me, I think the most right now, I think the public understands if they have limited access to city hall. I think they understand if there's limited service. Anything, I mean, a dog license is not a priority right now. Okay, I mean, it's not. I mean, in my opinion, so if somebody has to wait or they have to do it online or they don't get their dog license renewed for three weeks, okay, well, you know, fine. We won't give you a ticket. We won't charge you a late fee or whatever it may be. Um, but, 
as it relates to our employees, I want to make sure that they feel um, safe and healthy. I also think this is a stressful time for every single one of us in the, in the community, in the state, and in the country, and in the world. I mean, we've never seen anything like this. And I think any minimization or burden and stress that we can take away from our employees to make it easy for them to care for a parent or care for children or, um, you know, care for uh, however they, you know, if they get ill to stay home and make life easier without making it, you know, overburdensome and over costly, both to their emotions and to their piggy bank. Um, I think it's, it's our responsibility to, to look at those and make sure that we take care of the people that take care of us as well and set an example. So, uh, and I know, Mr. Gillum, you're working through the contracts. You're seeing what's happening in the package from Washington, D.C. and all of these things. But I think that's an important point. I mean, at the end of the day, we're not going to win a budget here, or lose a budget here um, by being, <coughs> you know, thrifty with our people. It's highly likely we could lose people and not have people start up once this goes away. So we want to make sure that, you know, we are very cognizant. We ask our people to step up all the time when times are tough. And now when times are tough for everybody, we have to step up as well. Mr. Gillen. Just a, <coughs> kind of a follow-up comment. I, it, it, what I'm talking about in terms of closing the building to the public, that's not completely unprecedented around here. Right. You know, on Friday afternoons, staff is here working. But the doors just aren't open to the public. And I was half joking with somebody today. They said, well, that just means every day around here is going to be like a Friday afternoon. Yeah. So more or less that's correct. Um, and in the, the same as it is on Friday afternoons, if there's a specific issue that needs to have face-to-face -face contact, we can set up an appointment. We can go down. We can <coughs> go down to the door. We let somebody in. We can bring them up to our office. We can, we can hash out whatever needs to be hashed out. They can leave. We can lock the door behind them. And you can wash your hands, and you can stay 20 feet away when you do it. Yeah. All right. So, Commissioner Proust and then Commissioner Lavasser. <clears throat> um, I think the steps that you've outlined so far are, are, are very um, responsible, and, and not only in terms of the employees, but also to the public. Um, I think limiting access to the building to the public is a wise move because electronically we can do so much these days. And it's not as if there's not going to be anyone here working. At a, you, you know, a limited staff, but definitely the various departments are still going to be functioning. Um, and as you say, if there's an essential need for them to meet face-to-face, -face, that, that can be worked out. But I think the more that we can <clears throat> limit um, interpersonal contact between various employees and then the, the employees and the public, the better because we can still manage city functions. And we know that this is not going to be over overnight. But on the other hand, it's not going to last, hopefully, for, um, yeah, we're all knocking on wood, um, a, a year. You know, this is a temporary thing. And, and I think everyone understands that it's a new normal and we're all going to have to adjust. So I, we have to have a balance between, I mean, we're in the public service business. That's what we do. But on the other hand, um, we have obligations to our employees, and we have obligations to the public, too. We can't give them an opportunity to come into the building and mingle with other people who might be contagious. So, you know, it's, it's a delicate balancing act. But I think the things that you've done so far are good. But I, I would be very comfortable just saying, you know, we're going we're gonna to limit public ask us to the building, um, period. And just to be clear, we're not only talking about City Hall. It would be the DPS. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think we're, I mean, we're also talking about closing the farmer's market, too, uh -huh. which, given the new CDC di guidelines, is probably something that we should do anyway. As I understand, I wasn't at the market on Saturday, but <clears throat> I know that um, when I talked with Shelly Mazur on Friday afternoon, she had been very concerned that, uh, and some of her vendors were concerned, that they were going to have at least one more weekend to try to clear some of their product. Mm -hmm without having all, all their, their, their produce to go bad, and they'd have to throw it out. Um, and then anecdotally, I heard that actually the number of, of vendors and customers that were there on Saturday was down significantly from what it normally is anyway. But I think we would have to say that the farmer's market is going to have to be closed uh, as well, well. The only question I have about that, I mean, we're not talking about from a statewide perspective, you know, banning grocery stores or anything like that. And I look at the farmer's market kind of like a grocery store, like that's where people get their access for food. <coughs> Any thoughts on that? I mean, assemblages of 10 or less, you know, as we heard today, um, you know, no restaurants or whatever carry out. I mean, is the farmer's market kind of 
consider like a grocery store maybe versus a assemblage center. I mean, maybe the flea market on Sundays. I don't know, but I mean, I think people's access to food is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be the other option to, to have it open on Saturday, but close it for after Saturday. I'd have it open on Sunday. I'd have to talk more with Shelly about that. But. And even if, I mean, this may be a crazy idea, but, you know, if, if people are struggling still to get food at, you know, grocery stores, um, you know, and things of that nature, does it make sense if these farmers have food instead of throwing it away? Does it make sense to have them stay open, you know, that Friday, maybe even the Sunday? I don't know. I mean, just to keep the crowds down, people can come to the farmer's market on Saturday and Sunday. I mean, I'm sure that I'm brainstorming here, and I shouldn't do that on the public meeting and put you on the spot <laughs> or Shelly Mazur on the spot. But, you know, just ideas we can look at because the food security is going to be an issue as time goes on here. And I think that's another topic we're going to have to tackle as a body here once we, you know, figure some things out. I'm sorry, Commissioner Perush, we kind of jumped into your conversation. That's okay. A, a question, first of all, in terms of the farmer's market, <clears throat> excuse me, allergies are driving me crazy. What CDC guideline are you referring to, because I haven't read the most recent ones, when you're relating it to the farmer's market? Is it the assemblage <clears throat> um, issue? And I, and I haven't seen any, but I, again, I heard a report that, uh, at least according to the president, that the new CDC guideline is that it should be groups of less than 10. Okay. Should be encouraged. Anything above that should not be allowed. So, Commissioner Lavasser. Uh, it's quite unusual times, and I, I do think some extreme measures we wouldn't take typically are warranted, and I do think that means limiting the access to the buildings, with the exception a farmer's market for purposes of the food vendors. That would be the exception I'd make. But with regard to city hall, as you mentioned, no need for someone to be coming in to do something that could be done over the phone, could have been done online, done in some other fashion, done through the mails. Uh, I, I would leave open the, the opportunity for, for folks to set appointments for some things that are extreme that do require in person, but, but we have to get people out of the habit during this time of showing up in person because it's just not a good thing to be doing right now. Uh, with regard to the farmer's market, uh, I, I see no reason we should be proceeding on Sundays for the flea market, but yes, it's a grocery store essentially on Saturdays. That should remain. There shouldn't necessarily be seating areas for people to have a cup of coffee and to socialize and mingle, but we need to have that available for people to get their, their produce. And that, that's the way I would move in this in this instance. Commissioner Dubuck. Mm. I'm somewhat compelled by the argument that the market serves as a grocery store and certainly shouldn't be closing down grocery stores. Um, capacity and public gathering concern me though. Um, so I don't know if we just post best practices or make sure that the market is putting out messaging about, you know, not lingering, like do your business and please. <laughs> You know, take your groceries and leave. Um, and just to keep the, the crowd the crowd down. Um, uh, I agree that I think we can do most business remotely or, or by appointment, so I think it makes sense to close City Hall. I think we just want to make sure we're really conscious of having very large signage at the entrance with the appropriate phone numbers to call about this or that. Um, and did, I, did we mention animal shelter? We didn't, but I mean, I, that's a city facility as far as I'm concerned. Right. So, and we should, probably shouldn't have tra folks trafficking through there either. Just you know, mm -hmm. whatever the manager Just needs care to for care animals. for the animals. Yeah. And again, I would say, like, if someone's dog or is found, you know, that's an appointment situation to say, okay, you can come and pick up your dog. But I think those engagements need to be restrictive in the human-to-human -human interaction. You know what I mean? Not necessarily suggesting that we install, you know, plastic rotating windows at every door, but you know, I think that we have to be cognizant where, um, even though it makes sense to to have a, a meeting in very very rare circumstances, if you need proof of ID, something happens, you know, um, that we keep a very safe distance and you know exercise good almost lockout procedures where you put the document down and then step away and then the other person and then wash, make sure employees are washing their hands after every engagement. Um, 
you know, I'll get to you, Commissioner Lavasser, in a second, because Commissioner, Commissioner Douglas uh, had her hand up. Uh, her just hands. a quick note. Uh, last I knew, there were no more adoptable animals at the um, animal shelter. They'd all been adopted out. So we're just, at this point, Correct. unless something has changed since then, just talking strays. Oh, yeah, there should be more um, Helps. capacity there, yeah. you know, to weather the storm. <laughs> Commissioner Lavasser? Uh, I'm, I'm looking for a motion that Mr. Gillum needs so that I can simply say, yeah, what he said, and, and move it. <laughs> If you want to provide the language, or I'll, I'll take a shot if you want me to. Well, I, I think just a, a motion to uh, close city facilities to the public, consistent with our discussion at the table tonight. So moved. Do we, do we need an end date or? Indefinitely, I think. Indefinitely. Okay. Second I'll by support. Commissioner. Oh. Whatever. Second. Sorry, second by Commissioner Dubuck. He had his hand up quick. Um, Commissioner Macy. It's only tangentially related to this motion, but it was made before I could make my comments. Um, I know you said we shouldn't be brainstorming at the table, but this is all new, so I'm going to brainstorm at the table. I broke the rule. <laughs> um, is, would it be possible to provide some additional sick leave that's used just, it's able to be used just for this period? Um, I'm asking partially because my employer did that, Go Blue. Um, they, made, they made some time available. If you need to take time off for any release, reason related to COVID-19, your own illness, someone else's, or just because your life is craziness. Is it possible for us to, I mean, you've talked about some people who might be running out of sick leave, and we don't want anybody to be run, to, who's run out of sick leave to think, eh, it's just a cough, I'll come into work. Um, so I want to make sure everybody has at least something banked right now. So that's one idea. And this is totally not related, but when Commissioner Dubuck was talking about signs and having them out, it reminded me of another great idea that Commissioner Dubuck had about signs. Uh, which was involving our restaurants, which was putting, getting some signs together to put outside uh, restaurants that are doing this um, to go, take out and to go, that maybe um, we, there's, we'll have some more of these 30 minute or 15 minute just pick up take out spots. So instead of having to like, you know, put your credit card in to pay for an hour's worth of time, that we designate some takeout spots around our restaurants that are going to be providing that service. Yeah. So just while we're talking, there's solid. Well, I think we're going to get to that as item 13, about the oh. city ramen discussion and what we can do for downtown yes. restaurants. All right. Yeah. I mean, valid points. Let's pretend that I put, said that then. <laughs> well, no, I think it's, it's good. I think we have to, you know, this is moving so fast, we're going to have to exhaust good ideas and, you know, every other idea. Bad ones, too. Sometimes good ideas turn into bad yeah. ideas, but I think right now there we, you know, given the dire situation with the recent order, every idea is a good idea. So, could we get could we get staff to look into the idea of additional sick leave, something like that? I don't have I don't have a problem with that at all. Again, we're, we're the, the 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 piece of the puzzle we're waiting for right now is the legislation in Washington. And again, we, yeah. we there has been analysis done as to what that would mean, and it, and it's a, really it's an extension of existing benefits under the Family Medical Leave Act. Mm -hmm. So if you're eligible for FMLA benefits, if the legislation makes it through the Senate in its current form, there would be an extension of those benefits. So once we know what the landscape is, then we can try to identify where the holes are and where we may need to try to fill them. Okay. In the meantime, we're not yeah. going to stop paying anybody or not fire anybody, or if somebody needs to go home, the supervisor's going to authorize, like, look, yeah, we'll figure it out. But, you know, we have some general policies now, but we'll see what the legislation has, and then you and your team will figure out in the spirit of, you know, the situation, making it right by all. I'm confident that you, of anyone, Mr. Gillum, you can do that. Thank you. I appreciate that. I like to think we can. So, yeah. We have a motion on the table. Any more discussion, Mr. Gillum? As long before, before we shift gears to any other <coughs> subject, let's talk a little bit about our <coughs> schedule. Yeah. Again, my intention would be that... <laughs> The only meetings that the city is going to have are meetings that that, that we need to have. Um, <clears throat> the DDA is going to meet on Friday afternoon because, as I understand, there are some time-sensitive issues on the DDA's agenda. Um, the Historic District Commission is going to be meeting because we have a resident um, that's been waiting for, I think, at least a month to get who, that's in a historic district that needs a certificate of appropriateness to be able to put a new roof on his or her house. Mm -hmm. And the committee has had a hard time getting a quorum together for a variety of reasons. It looks like they, they're going to have a quorum this week, so we would like them to go ahead and meet. They're going to go ahead and meet. Um, so that's just a couple of examples. But other than that, generally speaking, as far as I'm concerned, all non-essential meetings are canceled. As I've <clears throat> excuse me, indicated to you, 
Mr. Mayor, the only meetings generally that I see as essential are our meetings, the City Commission meetings, because we need you to keep making decisions to keep everything moving forward. And I expect there'll be abbreviated meeting agendas going forward, but we still need you to approve payroll, to approve claims so people can get paid. We still need to have our vendors paid so we can still get materials and services provided to us and things like that. So I would expect that other than our meetings, we probably aren't having too many other city commission meetings or too many other city meetings of any kind. Again, except there are, if there are some exigent circumstances or some compelling needs, then those groups will go ahead and meet. But that would also include, we currently have a work session scheduled for Tuesday the 31st on recreational marijuana. And I would expect that we're going to cancel that meeting as well. Um, just so everybody is aware, um, that will mean that we're going to have to push out the opt-out. Uh, so I'm going to have to be bringing ordinances to you to extend the June 1 opt-out. I don't know. I'll have to think about it maybe for another 90 days or something like that to give us time to get all of our schedules together. You remember how hard it was for us to find a date that everybody was going to be available for that night. But again, in terms of bringing us together and in terms of, of the type, as the mayor brought out when we talked about it, the type of input we're going to get from the public at a meeting is the public going to want to come into a set. It's a workshop. It's, yeah. So, so anyway, just so everybody is clear, that meeting will be canceled under the, the motion that's on the table right now. So. I, I, Commissioner Vass. I take that uh, the extension would require first reading on a change to the ordinance, the second meeting in April. Is my timing it right? Uh, yeah, it would be the second meeting in April and then the first meeting in May would be second reading. That's correct. Yeah. That ordinance, then that would follow the normal process. Yeah. I, I think when, you know, we look at the, the meeting on the 31st, I mean, the whole purpose of us pulling that together was to solicit a lot of, you know, community input in a, in a exchange dialogue to get industry experts, the community, our commission together to get a lot of questions answered and to help shape and form our direction moving forward. I guess my concern about having it is, uh, one, you know, um, obviously, is it essential uh, right now? Uh, number two, um, are we going to invite people to come in that may not really want to come in, but, you know, it's an important issue for them, however passionate they feel about it, and then we, you know, are totally risking public health by having a meeting that's bigger than it should be or at all. And, you know, without full participation and full invitement, we may have a situation where, you know, we suboptimize the result of that workshop. So, you know, I think um, I'm not sure there's going to be any rush to open up a lot of businesses right now or do whatever given the, given the climate. So I don't know that it's going to push us back theoretically on any service that was going to be delivered here in the city. Um, and clearly, notwithstanding an act of God, we kind of said, okay, we got to resolve this issue. Well, we have an act of God right now in front of us. So... Um, that's kind of my position on it. I don't know how you guys feel, but unless someone wants to fight to have the workshop, um, you know, I think we consider it canceled. Not canceled, postponed. Postponed, postponed. yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and we'll, make the, we'll have to make the, you know, update to the ordinance, and, and maybe we can get creative, probably not. <laughs> but, you know, with a timeline when things are lifted then the clock starts or something like that I don't know I mean those those are harder to manage but um, you know yeah. good. and and you know we'll find with some of these other city commission meetings I think we keep them in place um, but we'll have um, uh, guidance hopefully from you know the state legislature about <clears throat> you know what can we do you know to get participation but do some things virtually and you know we'll see how that goes we can we can try and maybe even, you know, change the dynamic of this room here if we need to. So, okay. All right, so we still have a motion on the table. Um, any more discussion on that motion? All right, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion passes. Thank you for all your comments and your input. I appreciate it. Well, Dave, I know you've worked uh, tirelessly, and the department heads have, and, and uh, our fire chief and our police chief, and... Um, you know, I got to say, it, it, it's um, you know, we're fortunate to have good people working for us, and um, 
you know, we'll, we'll get through this with, with strong leadership and, and strong talent in our ranks. So, um, well, it's, it's been a team effort and it will continue to be. So, and you'll keep us surprised of any updates that are material to the decision just made. I will. Absolutely. Okay, that brings us to the second item we added to the agenda, which is the pending litigation, Paradiso versus the City of Royal Oak. Quick um, discussion, Mr. Gillum. Uh, <coughs> Mayor and Commissioners, it is, um, we discussed in closed session, um, this is a case um, involving a sidewalk trip and fall that was recently remanded from the Michigan Supreme Court back to the Michigan Court of Appeals for further consideration by the Court of Appeals. Um, in conjunction, con connection with the remand, um, there have been some um, initial settlement discussions between the plaintiff's attorney and counsel for the city. Um, I would ask the commission to um, approve a resolution tonight authorizing um, outside counsel to proceed in this matter as we discussed in closed session tonight. Reference those settlement discussions. Commissioner Levasseur. So moved. A motion by Commissioner Lavasser. Support. And second by Commissioner Perouche. Discussion? All right, with that, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you for your work on that as well, Mr. Gillum. Um, this brings us to item number 13, which, um, you know, came to our tent, not didn't. We had a, a, a particular business, City Ramen, um, you know, make a proposal uh, regarding a very unique situation that they're facing with their plan of operation, et cetera, but um, also wanted to, you know, have that, um, you know, Mr. Gattaro came here tonight as well, and I think that, you know, there are many other restaurateurs and retailers in our downtown that um, are feeling the impact of this without a doubt, and I think that, um, you know, we can talk about the city ramen situation, but I think we also need to talk a little bit more broadly and maybe give uh, staff some um, discretion to uh, explore a few options for us to make sure that, you know, the businesses that, you know, we cherish mm -hmm. in our community have um, at least a chance of, of, of success and, and survival during these most challenging times. So, um, <coughs> Chief O'Donoghue, you can elaborate a little bit more on the city ramen situation and, and maybe what the ask is and, and what our options are. Sure. Uh, city, uh, Mayor and City Commission, we did have a request from City Ramen to adjust their plan of operation. Um, when they made the request, uh, the idea was to get it on the next city commission meeting, and we thought uh, with, with everything they're doing, it would make sense if, if they want to be able to pivot because of the drastic changes, we should try to help them. <coughs> we actually did tell them they didn't need to come to the meeting today. We would advocate for them, but uh, they... Uh, uh, they, they wanted the, the option to open early, and in fact, they talked about that when we first approved them, and I'm kicking myself because I was like, hey, why don't we just do it now, And but we didn't. So they want to adjust their hours to open at 11, but they also want to activate their SDM license, which is a license they had, and it, we mentioned that they had no plans of <coughs> utilizing it, um, and all that does is for allow off-premise consumption. So if you want to order your food with some sake or something, you can order it all together and take it with you. Um, we have no problem with the request, and uh, we could easily adjust their plan of operation with the approval of the City Commission. Any questions for the Chief? Uh, Commissioner Lavasser? I, I take that the SDM license is critical here for uh, the, the, the take out <coughs> alcohol from the premises. So, so yes, and they already have it. It's just not included in their plan of operation. They already was, we approved the license, so they're going to activate it. But do, do we know if there's any other situations around town where people have an inactive SDM license? Uh, many of our restaurants have active SDMs. I'm not aware of anyone that has, has an SDM and it's inactive, although it's likely the ones that don't have one might try to get one. I don't know how long that process will take with the state. We're talking about bottled and sealed beverages, or yes. we're not talking about Growlers. just so the public knows styrofoam cups full of Correct. You know, ice and sake yeah. or wine. Right. Beer, beer and wine. Beer and wine. Yeah. Beer and wine. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Gibbs. Without trying to jump the gun, um, can we open this up to discuss other restaurants in the in town that also have evening only hours? For example, Lu Luigi's restaurant. Um, and there is, I know we have a couple of other ones 
that are, are only open in the evening, but to oh. see what we can do about I, extending their hours well, on a temporary basis, if nothing else. I, I would think most of our plans of operation are really <coughs> concerned about patrons coming in and whatever. I wouldn't have any objection, instead of talking about individual businesses, I wouldn't have any objection to say, I mean, if, um, you know, during, so as long as the in-dining ban is on, that, um, you know, restaurants can be open at 11 a.m. Okay. for food delivery. I mean, there's, I don't know how the chief feels about that. Maybe that's a jump, but I don't see that as being a leap of security concerns for. With the, the, with the hours they don't of already have it. I don't think anyone had a concern about people being open for lunch. It's more like. The end, like some places we wanted maybe to close at midnight or right for what kind so um, perhaps and maybe just give the police chief author or the police department authorization to extend right. hours earlier not later but earlier right just moving forward and it make it easier even when we get back to normal if a business wants to kind of doing well and wants to expand it save them a step Mr. Labasso. Do you need, right, and that's an easy motion, do you need anything else that would also facilitate things with, with using the SDM licenses? Well, that, yes, that would, yes, I, I guess uh, my, that, that's a little bit bigger of a step, so it's up to the commission. If you want the police department just to approve it and at our discretion and they can appeal them if we say no, that's, we can do that. Um, you know, we, we got here because um, we put very strict, very clear restrictions on the <coughs> plan of operation. If we don't hold them to that plan of operation, it's, it's meaningless. So if you want to just give the police department authorization to make some changes to it without city commission approval, um, I, I think that would be easy for us to manage. And maybe like what we do with the special events, if it's a special event that I think in my judgment, the commission will want to approve. Um, I bring it to you, even 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 though technically I'm only supposed to bring ones that are using city services that they're not being compensated for. So, um, I, you know, at least temporarily, if we want to do something like that, we can make reasonable changes to plans of operation to accommodate um, until this crisis is we'll be on the crisis. That might be the easiest way. The issue, I think, is every day is different, so we might solve a problem today, and then there's new changes, and, and just being able to adapt might be the best option. So I heard two things from the chief. I heard the you know, ability to give the police department discretion to look at earlier opening hours, not later, but you know, later is never an issue, or earlier never seems to be an issue. Uh, later, we talk about whatever, but to, to, to give them the discretion to update plans of operation for operating hours, and then also for those, you know, perhaps who have um, SDM active licenses, um, you know, to incorporate that into the plan of operation during the, you know, at their discretion for a time period, you know, to be determined um, arguably while the ban's in effect. Aren't those two separate motions, though? I mean, you could make it all in one motion if you wanted to. You could tie it up. Hmm? Well, but the STM is specifically, well, I guess Well, no, not. if you grant it for all, then yeah, it, it affects that's city why, and ramen as well. You know. Yeah, that's why I stopped myself. So the motion, I'll make a motion. Okay, Commissioner okay. Douglas. Help me craft this as we go. <clears throat> that the police department um, be granted the authority to allow... Uh, liquor serving establishments to um, begin their uh, amend their hours of operation to open earlier mm -hmm. than their uh, uh, operational plan dictates um, and to extend that same right to those with SDM licenses um, to sell SDM uh, in their hours of operation. Is that I think it's to authorize those without SDMs to utilize an SDM. The ones that are already there can already do it. Um, I, I don't, it's possible we have somebody with an SDM that isn't activated. I can't think of one. I don't, um, so I, I, I think that Commissioner Lovastro is getting to if, if another restaurant that has a liquor license wants to offer off-premise consumption. So if I am show up, I can get my dinner and 
my favorite beer I have there, or whatever. Or, um, I, 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 I don't think there's going to be a lot of that, but yeah. I mean, at least make it something. Start. So to authorize those without SDMs to obtain and use them. Yes. Okay. That's my motion. Is there a second? Is that good? Yeah. Second. <clears throat> And that covers. I'll, yeah, I'll second that. Raman so also. Second by Commissioner Gibbs, Mr. Gillum. Just to clarify, and that's for the period of time that the governor's most recent executive order is in place. Yes. Okay. Right. Yes. Okay, discussion. Commissioner Macy, and then I saw Commissioner Lavaster's hand up. Oh, you answered. Um. So you said for liquor serving establishments only, and I, I guess I wasn't clear that were those the only ones who were possibly looking to push hours earlier. I don't know that non-liquor establishments have a plan of operation. Correct. They don't, ah. Those are the only ones that are subject to this plan. They want. Yeah. <laughs> Without okay. our approval. Okay, gotcha. All right, any discussion? All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, motion passes. Um, so, Ms. Lip, I think you're good to go if the chief is good to go when he gives you the good to go, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Good to go. All right. Um, there's some other things we want, Ms. Oh, Ms. Commissioner Gibbs. I, I thought you were trying to wrap it up, but I wanted to throw something else in here before we wrap it up. Well, I was going to, yeah, I was going to lean into that, like some other things that um, have kind of come up, and I'm sure we've all been approached by different business and restaurant owners about parking things yes. and other things the city can do. Um, I know we'll have 101 ideas come here from the table. I mean, it took us, you know, I think an hour and a half to figure out if we were going to comp, you know, um, disabled parking <laughs> for uh, meter lots at one time. Um, I think if, if, if things come up with parking, I mean, there's a few rules that we have to pay attention to with our bonds and things like that. But there's also some things we can do uh, to make carry out, pick up, things like that very easy, you know, from a logistical perspective. Um, not that we should just give all the authority to the city manager's office and Ms. Davids and the, the police department, but I think that, um, you know, we could allow them some autonomy to work and try things um, because I don't think we have the time during this uh, period to, um, you know, debate. I mean, every hour counts, right? So I think if, if someone were up to allowing, you know, city staff to, to work with various logistical scenarios to help the restaurants um, however whatever those are we don't even know what they are and give them some authority and autonomy uh, at least during this period I mean, we can always go back and, and advise them and unwind something they've made that's not a problem but I don't think it's a life or death situation um, to give them the authority to make some decisions if it's carry out lanes or you know bagging me whatever they just they think is is fine Commissioner Perush and I seem to recall that Mr. Gillum said that the DDA is meeting on Friday. Wednesday. Wednesday. Um, and they're the parking committee, and most parking decisions have to go through them. But they're also more connected directly through the downtown manager with the downtown businesses. So my guess is that they're going to be getting these same kinds of questions and things. Mm. Um, and they also might have some ideas yep. um, and suggestions in terms of how how we manage this whole issue. So I, I think it's fortuitous that they were meeting within the next couple of days mm -hmm. because they've been involved with the parking situation for so long, so intimately. Um, so. Yeah, I can uh, request recommendations. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, from the DDA on Wednesday, absolutely. <clears throat> and, I, and I think the key here is that we don't, you know, if we, if we give authority, I mean, not just to the, I mean, the DDA does have a say, obviously, but they only meet once a month as well, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the key here is to give some you know, um, tactical advantage. I mean, the best run organizations, you know, in terms of crisis and in modes like this is having people you trust on the line, in the trench, being able to make a split second decision. And I think um, Chief probably knows that better than anyone being a former Marine. So I think in this case, we have to, we have to rely on the people we trust uh, to make sure we can't, you know, this isn't a time to be overly bureaucratic. Um, mm -hmm. Do we need that in the form of a motion or, um, is the public discussion good enough to um, avoid any potential scorn for a decision, you know? I mean, I think, uh, Chief, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, I think the staff has a fair amount of discretion anyway as to time limits on meters and things like that. Yeah, I think we do, but we always have brought them here. I, I think we're going to be experimenting. We want to, like, see what 
what are the new patterns and and be able to pivot with those. If if all the meters need to go to 30 minute meters because nobody's dining in and everyone's coming and going, we want the ability to to be as flexible as possible so as behavior changes we can change with it and do whatever we can to ease the burden. That's kind of the yeah, I don't think it'll be perfect, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of opportunities to say we did it wrong, but uh, it, we want to just understand, like, we want to try things that, to help. So. Commissioner Lavasser. How, how challenging would it be to, to change everything to 30 minutes only on a, what we would hope would be a short-term basis? I think it's not that challenging, but I can't say for certain. Uh, uh, it, I, I'm not. I'm not certain. I think with the smart meters, it's easy. Ex less in the, in, our, in our, the core of the downtown. Commissioner Proust. And you wouldn't have to change every single meter. Maybe you just took on the core central area that where yep. all the restaurants are, no. um, and, the, and then in the outer perimeter, you wouldn't have to juggle anything with. But if if you're talking about where most of the restaurants are, that might not be as overwhelmingly complicated than changing them all. Yeah. Yes. We've given some thought to this before. Uh, Ms. Davids uh, did with the um, 30 minutes that we put in place. And um, and I think there's a whole myriad of ideas that you guys can explore and work with restaurateurs, work within our covenants, work within the laws, work within our contracts, and everything like that to come up with that will, that will and, and, and maybe some operational limitations with, you know, meters being difficult to change or whatever. I mean, I think you guys can be agile with that. Um, <clears throat> what if we left it that uh, we'll take this discussion as authorization to explore and even implement mm -hmm. different alternatives, and we can report back to you as early as the meeting in two weeks as to what we've done? Yeah. So, let's yeah. do it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Get creative, find solutions, work with our business partners. Um, don't be afraid to take a risk. I mean, we can't take any risks with people's health, but we certainly can offset you know, that situation by taking risks here. And if you, if, and if the seven of you collectively feel that we're going down the wrong road, yeah. then you can let us know. So, yeah, like if, if you had a bad night and you just banned parking all in the downtown together, we'd probably say that's that's a bad idea. You know, not that I would expect that, but you know, <laughs> we'll make sure you're aware if uh, we have any. And and I think we'll, you know, this will be a good way to to test our um, productivity and rely on relationships that we have in the community to make the right thing. We got to come together, and this is. And if we're going to come together, we got to work quickly, and we got to trust those that are working for us. Commissioner Lavasser, I, I trust our our city manager will make the right decision, and if he doesn't, we can always replace him. <laughs> <laughs> we have a list of people. Ouch. Yeah. Any of them, right? Anyone's better than Dave. <laughs> do you need a motion, or do we already have a motion? I think uh, I think you feel comfortable, right? I'm I'm comfortable with the discussion at the table. Yeah. Now. Okay, so that kind Except of for the last part. Yeah, yeah. he was going to. <laughs> now, do we do we extend that to to parking? I mean, I think that mostly we talked about parking, but um, I don't know if there's anything else that you guys see that we need. Um, you know, two weeks is a long time not serving any 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 um, um, food and, and and beverage in the industry. I mean, there's probably other things we can do to support. Um, is there anything that you would, any types of things that you couldn't work with like a Luigi to figure out and implement that, that would need city approval, that you might need some preclearances, or most things do you feel that you've heard in the community you can work with the restaurant operators and make decisions, you know, uh, notwithstanding a decision from this board? And I'm just trying to figure out what else there is that we would actually have the authority to do. Ask Judy. Um, Luigi's got an idea. Well, actually, if we could have, I'll, I'll break a little precedent here and ask Luigi to come up here and, uh, and Judy as well um, to maybe share just a couple ideas. Um, you know, we won't comment on the merits of them so much, but throw the types of things out there that you've heard that we might be able to assist with. Oh, well, I was on the phone. I heard that um, Blaze Pizza is, like, doing free delivery and things like that. Um, but I think that... For a long time, we've talked about having like a lunch club at City Hall. So maybe we could just, you know, order up like a bunch of, you know, like collectively just, uh, you know, 
make a commitment to like buy lunch from a different restaurant every day and have one person go over and bring everything back. I mean, I mean, we can't force people to do it, but that's one thing I can think of just off the top of my head. It's something that we've wanted to do for a long time okay. anyways. And I, and I think from a marketing perspective, we can use social media and those things oh, yeah, in cooperation sure. to promote like whatever the restaurateurs come together if they're doing like a special takeout night or whatever. I mean, I, I think that goes without saying we can use our media reach to, to, to get to people. Uh, Luigi, what ideas you got? Mr. Cataro, sorry. I've known you so long I, as Luigi. I really appreciate it. Give me a couple minutes. Um, I heard, uh, Mr. Mayor, what you were saying. Um, um, as I was saying earlier, you know, uh, two weeks, it's, it might be not a long time, but it is a long time um, for a restaurant. Okay. Um, yeah, it's great that we bring some lunch on the city. All that just you, you plug in a little hole in a sinking boat. I think when you look at the logistic, okay, right now you cannot go inside of any establishment and and eat or have lunch or dinner. So basically, the only choice you have is to do what they call curb service, okay? <coughs> Which, uh, it's okay when you leave, when you got a place, when you got an establishment with parking. Unfortunately, most of the establishment in Royal Oak, we don't have the luxury, okay? Basically, uh, when we do curb service, curb service, I think we will open a door for liability. Because basically, if people got to stop on the street, because most likely the parking it will be taken. So, and when we talk about logistics, a server or someone will go outside, bring the food out, and let him sign for the credit card, okay? I think that's not a very good idea thing. Like I said, it's, it can be dangerous. I believe that... It would be, I think it would be sent a signal to the community, uh, to the restaurants, to, this, to the rural community, to actually um, have a reserve parking for the time being, okay? Our governor say it would be, what, four weeks? I think for the four weeks, we should have just um, put some uh, sign Instead of change all the mirror, which it will cost a lot of money, I think we should just beg it, beg someone. Like I want to give you an example, my place. Give me one parking spot, two parking spot, reserve for uh, curb service. They will help the business extremely. Okay, and most of the restaurant, I mean, it's all where we need two parking spaces. Okay, I think I believe that's the answer you know and the way things are going i think you know it would be nice if the dda or someone would ship the cost for that i mean we're not going to make no money with curb and gutter like you say we we have to work together that's the only way we can survive we have to work together but i think everyone everyone um um as uh, uh, commissioner perusha was saying no i'm sorry Commissioner uh, Macy was saying, there's all those signs on the, um, there's a few signs already on some of the restaurants, which, by the way, I think they look extremely ugly. But I think if we let the crowd, if we let the people know, if we let the media know, the Royal Oak actually would do have a curb and gutter in a safe environment, I think that would be, uh, I, I think it would be the right step to do. I think, thank you, thank Luigi. You. And, and I think, too, I mean, we've had discussions about some of our covenants, but, I mean, you can argue that without, you know, a curb delivery, nobody's going to be, I mean, your, your amount of revenue that you get into the city is zero anyways because nobody's dining there. And, I mean, you're talking <laughs> nominal pennies. And if the DDA can do something at a nominal fee to check the box to say, yeah, I mean, you know, it shouldn't cost a lot to say we want to reserve these spaces – you also have enforcement. The restaurant owners are going to be out there. If somebody's parking all day there, trust me, they're going to say they're going to get that car moved, right? You know, I wouldn't want to make Luigi mad 
uh, parking my car in front of his place and, you know, going for a walk downtown or whatever. So I think you have some natural things built in there. Um, Luigi's a very nice man, actually. If I, if I were to do that, I'd probably park in front of Luigi's place because he's so kind. But um, so I think that, uh, um, you know, that's something, I think that's a good idea to look at. Like, that's about being creative, right? I know we have certain covenants we have to charge for parking, but who do we charge? We could charge the DDA. Is it a million dollars? No, because the, right now, honestly, the parking revenues are nil because of the situation. So, you know, you can offset it, bag it, you know, one to two to three, depending on the size of the restaurant or business. And, um, but we don't want to, we want to leave that discretion up to the, but it's one idea that I think all of us would feel comfortable with if you can vet it out correctly. No, and I think that's, that's, an, that's an easy fix if the DDA is willing to make up the difference. And if not, so. if the businesses want to chip in $5 a spot a week or something or a buck, you know, just to check the box of paying, I'm sure they'd do that too, you know. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Commissioner DeBuck? I think it's clear that the direction we've given is for them to brainstorm all those types of ideas, yep. figure out what's going to work best for our businesses, and I think we'll be supportive of whatever they land on because yeah. um, everyone's going to be feeling the pinch right now, and so if we have to feel the pinch to the extent that there is, uh, and the parking revenue, so be it. And if I get, to, if there's a small chance we get sued by a, um, you know, bondholder for for parking revenue, bring it on. <laughs> you know, I'm willing to have that fight. You know, we're not we're not worried. I mean, it's in their best interest too that we keep these restaurants in business because if they're, we got to make sure they survive at the end of this because then people are going to start coming back to downtown, filling the coffers of the parking bond revenue to maintain parking in the city, which makes bondholders happy. You know. Um, you don't want to kill your business, and then you know their bonds are worthless if we're if half our restaurants close. So we're protecting their interests as well. Okay, um, I think for any other ideas, I mean, I know two weeks is forever, but I think that you know maybe from the discussion here, unless anyone objects, if there's things you feel that are within your autonomy and your authority, Mr. Gillum, to make decisions on you know, um, and they have a little bit of risk with them and there's a little bit of gray area, I mean, we trust you. Um, I think you can make those decisions. If you want to run them by any of us ahead of time to get input via email or whatever to, you know, um, not make the vote or the decision, but just to mm -hmm. see, hey, are we crazy here? Is, you know, something we're not looking at correctly? Um, certainly do that, but, you know, this is the time where your leadership is most needed. Um, Chief O'Donoghue's leadership is most needed and the leadership from all of our staff and our business owners is needed. So um, I'm fully on board putting the generals in the field to, uh, you know, help address this crisis. And, and, you know, we can't be paralyzed by making a wrong decision and we can't be paralyzed by, you know, making a slow decision. So we have confidence. Yeah, there's a, there's a saying, it's easier to get forgiven than it is to get permission. We're giving you permission. Yep. <laughs> In that case. <laughs> Commissioner DeBuck, did you have something important to say? Oh, if you're looking for a motion to adjourn. Okay. <laughs> you're, uh, you're making a lot of motions. I'll though. second that. <laughs> well, I wasn't sure if you had any uh, intestinal issues or something. You're just moving around there. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner DeBuck. Is there a second? I, Commissioner Gibbs. I got it. Commissioner Gibbs. Okay, any discussion? All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. We're adjourned. Everyone be safe.